All right, welcome to the Rescue Storm Mindset Podcast. Let's keep the intro short today. So we have none less than a fellow Canadian, a search and rescue technician, SAR techs as they call them, the guys in the orange jumpsuits. They do skydiving, they do scuba diving, they jump out of planes, onto mountains, into the ocean, from Antarctica. It's awesome. It's epic. It's a long episode. We get into search and rescue cases at the end. So make sure you tune in until the end. Again, you know what to do if you want to support this podcast. You go, you go on an Apple podcast, you rate and you review. We also have a Wildertainment podcast, which is mine telling just ridiculous outdoor adventure stories. Wildertainment podcast, Rescue Storm Mindset podcast, rate and review. And of course, if you want to support us to keep going, you can do that by getting fit, getting strong, just like a rescue swimmer. And you can do that by going and purchasing one of our programs at the rescue We have hold your breath like a helicopter rescue storm program, which is my program teaching you apnea, teaching you different breath holding techniques to survive underwater. You have the become the expert program. If you're trying to tailor a training regimen and really get fit in a structured way. Cody developed that. We also have the win the day program. Win the day program is a program that trains you from start to finish as a rescue swimmer for beginners and advanced. And soon we will be coming out with the perfect form masterclass once it's finalized and edited for all those who want to perfect their swimming like helicopter rescue swimmers. That's it. Rescue swimmer my pizza podcast. Here we go. My guest, Sergeant Gregory Hudson. Canadian SAR technician. First Canadian on the show as well. I'm very excited. Right on, man. Me too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. How did you hear about us? Uh, one of my buddies uh, sent me a, a tape of you guys, a podcast. He sent it over and started listening to it and kind of dived in that way. And when I reached out maybe to try to get some joint training going with, uh, with you guys, because I knew you were kind of close by and then it kind of just grew from there, I guess. Yeah, you guys do a lot of joint training with the U.S. How does that operate typically? Is that like the command they get together to do different operations? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, like the Sartex will uh, try to hook up with PJs or Coast Guard and try to figure out a way we can do some joint training. So I've gone down to different uh, PJ stations and done some training with them. And then we got uh, our officers, our our pilots will try to link up some training too for helicopter uh, stuff so we'll go down and use a, an air base station there for a bit uh when the weather gets cold here so mm. we can get to fresh uh nice open water and keep our our boat qualifications and our water work stuff up when it freezes over in the winter so our pilots don't uh, get rusty oh yeah now have you heard of advanced helicopter rescue swimmer school in astoria and I, I know you guys join up for that quite a bit yeah i have heard about that i just heard about that last uh 2020 when i went down to miami i uh, went down to the coast guard station there for a, we call it a boat camp. We're going to go out and just do boat work all day um, and night, stuff like that. And uh, those guys started talking about it and told me about it. And that was my first exposure to the Coast Guard um, proper, actually being like in the facility training with them. Uh, the base I'm at now in Trenton, they do that every year because the water freezes up. They don't have the salt water like the coast have. So the coast, we can keep boats in the water all year long. So yeah, I just went down there and met. Uh, some Coast Guard guys and said, hey, these are uh, they're kind of doing what we're doing. So let's figure out a way to to train together and do some joint ops where we can go on courses that that they are interested in. They can try to come on some of our courses, too. Right on. What do you think of the goofballs down in Miami? Oh, they were good, man. It was a good place. A nice facility. Uh, yeah, it was good stuff, man. I like it down there. Got middle of February up in Canada, going down to Miami, you can't, can never complain. Yeah. The Canadians like to immigrate to Florida, regardless, like just the tourists and stuff. It's filled with, especially Quebecers. I always hear they're complaining about us. I'm technically from Quebec originally. They're yeah. always complaining about the the damn French Co- Canadians down there and cursing up a storm and stuff. Oh, yeah. With COVID, at least they got that relief for, for now. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Right on. Yeah. So again, first Canadian on the show. Should we just try to speak with Canuck accents the whole time, eh? I, I thought I was. Yeah, I could do the French uh, Canadian accent for... Uh, half of the show and then you can take it from there that's more like french for friends <laughs> yeah do you speak you speak french then yeah yeah c'est ma première langue première fois que just sympathetic yeah c'est, c'est la première fois que je parle en français sur le podcast 
No, I, I just really speak French. I know. I just said uh, it's the first time I've spoken French on this podcast. So there you go. Um, hey, I also like I, I see your your flag back there uh, that others may live. It's pretty interesting how all these search and rescue organizations like the PJs and uh, helicopter rescue swimmers and the Coast Guards like ours is so others may live. Yeah. And then the PJs, oh, I feel like the PJs is almost the same as I think it's as that others may live as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I really want to know who's the first to come up with this. Do you know the, yeah. the history behind that? No, I don't. Uh, no, I, it's in our uh, our creed, but I'm not sure who uh, came up with it first. I know uh, we were in the beginning, we were doing lots of parachute stuff uh, back in when it started. We were kind of like the ones that kicked off the, the search and rescue in Canada after the Second World War. Uh, we had bush pilots flying up north, uh, crashing, trying to take medication up and stuff like that up to uh, these remote uh towns and stuff like that all these people uh up there and trying to take antibiotics and vaccines and stuff like that and uh, the pilots were crashing uh surviving the crash but not uh, being able to survive the the elements so they uh some uh, world war ii pilots started this uh organization to go up in and rescue them so uh from the elements and this is kind of how it started for us in canada and then we just amalgamated from there so we're from back from the 1945 era and this has been going on 75 years now Oh, interesting. Now you're saying you guys were pretty much the first to do parachuting rescues as well. I'm not sure, but that's what, uh, that's what it sounded like when I was talking to some of our other guys that now we're the first, but we started, uh, that was kind of the main the driving forces. They started to, you know, getting volunteers to, to pump out, jump out of the airplanes and go in and do basic first aid and just uh, survival techniques. So they grabbing the, you know, the Bushmen's from, uh, Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec and kicking them out uh, under round canopies to get on the ground and, and uh, make sure these pilots were able to stay alive until the extraction plan could uh, be established with uh, helicopters and whatnot. No way. What's a Bushman in the 40s? I don't know. Just a Canadian, I guess, right? And Northern <laughs> Quebec or uh, Northern Ontario boy or something that just lives out in the in the bush and doesn't do a lot of city, sl- sl- city slick and stuff. Yeah, like oh, you look you look rugged enough. I see yeah. you cutting wood out in this in the, in the minus twenty degrees uh, without a shirt on. You want to yeah. jump out of plane, help some folks out? Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. Why don't we get into the actuality of current day becoming a SAR technician? So, um, well, let's get a little bit of your background. How long have you been a SAR tech for? Uh, just over six years now. Uh, yeah, I've been a SAR tech. I joined in two thousand fourteen. It was when I started my. Uh, initial course, I guess. So that's selection phase. And then from there, uh, I graduated a year later. It's about a year long course. Uh, and then I've been at the units ever since. Uh, I was out in Greenwood, Nova Scotia, which is near uh, Halifax at 413 Rescue Squadron. And then uh, now at 424 in Trenton, Ontario. Mm. Which do you prefer? Which station? Uh, they're both good. Ontario has lots to offer. Beautiful beaches. Uh, Toronto's close. Ottawa's close. Montreal's close. So Big, big area, um, different airframes, different places, but yeah, both really good uh, spots to work. I think they're definitely my favorite uh, that I've been to and I've, uh, I've worked at most of the bases just for a short period, got their augmentation or go out for some training event at uh, the other bases. And uh, I really like uh, Trenton and Greenwood are my two top picks. And if I could bounce between those two, uh, the rest of my career, I'd be a happy man. Really? See, I would have been all of, over like British Columbia, right? Like that seems yeah, like cool. it's super nice guys love it out there. Uh, my wife's not a big fan just because it's so far away from family. So she doesn't want to make the, the trip and the travel like that. So uh, she's given a lot uh, for me to be in the military for almost 16 years now. So I figured I'll give her that, uh, that dime back. I can, I can handle Trenton and Greenwood. So yeah. if I can, if I can ride it out, I will, but we'll see what happens. It's always uh, where they need guys, right? Yeah. So wait, so 16 years, let's, let's, let's get into this whole process of becoming a, a Sartec. So yeah. How do they select you? What's the, before you even get to attend the training, what's the process like to becoming a Canadian search and rescue technician? So, uh, right now you got to have a minimum, uh, I think three or four years, depending on your trade, uh, in. And then, so after that initial time is in, you can apply, you do your paperwork through your BPSO, which is a base personnel selection officer. So you go there and uh, tell them you're interested. They'll give you all the details, uh, start your application process, uh, make sure your aptitude test scores meet the minimum requirements and all that stuff. And then uh, from there, uh, you'll, you'll send paperwork, they'll go to Ottawa, then they'll look at the selection board to see if they're willing to take you as a candidate. Uh, once that paperwork's done, um, you get a message saying your course loaded for a selection phase. Uh, and that goes out in Alberta, go to Edmonton for the first first couple of days, do admin and stuff like that, and then start heading out into the 
uh, Jarvis Lake training facility where we do uh, a selection phase in the middle of the winter. That's cool. What's yeah. Wait, I, I, oh yeah, let's get back to the selection phase in half a second. But so you are saying you've been in the military for 16 years, but, uh, Sartec for six. So for yeah. 10 years, what, what are you doing? Yeah. So I joined as a, a combat engineer. So I spent my time up in uh, base Petawawa, which is an army base, um, yeah, as a combat engineer. So I did uh, a bunch of courses with them deployed to Afghanistan for a rotation, came back and figured I wanted to switch it up and do something different. And it's kind of you know, what's next, what else is on the horizon. And a lot of the qualifications that I had uh, through the army were relevant to start to Sartex. So, uh, combat diving, parachuting, repel, repelling, helo insertion, uh, fast rope, stuff like that. A uh, little mountaineering. So it was a good, easy transition. So I figured I had some buddies that were doing it. They told me about it and it looked like a, a cool job. So, uh, yeah, I went on selection, not knowing a ton about it. Like I said, it took me 10 years to, to realize, to even know what a Sartec was. I was in the Canadian military and I didn't know what a Sartec was until, you know, year eight kind of thing. So, uh, not really widely known, but. If you're not on an air base where the, the Sartex are flying every day, how, how do you know about them? They don't, we don't go up to army bases very often uh, to, to do jumps and fly around up there, right? It's an army helicopter, the other, their tactical stuff up there, and we don't really uh, go up there too often. There's no requirement. Yeah. I mean, shit, I don't know, Gregory. I, I found out about you, Sartex, before even joining the, the Canadian Coast Guard. But then again, I saw one. I saw one yeah. in operation. So that's how I got my, I guess, my ear to the grindstone. Yeah, and I really contemplated joining that organization the thing that ended up swaying me to become a u.s rescue swimmer aside from the guardian which is a great movie <laughs> uh, is just the qualification process of becoming a sartec and the fact that you had to serve so long and then hopefully get selected to attend the training the way i assessed it it seemed like i could get selected to become a rescue swimmer or at least have the opportunity to try with a shorter period of time so how did they end up selecting you though in, into this pipeline? That's a great question. I guess my resume looked good on paper because I had all those qualifications, all those courses, right? Uh, so kind of the prereqs. And if you don't have them through, you know, so we have guys that didn't, weren't in the army, they're in the Air Force or the Navy. So you can go out and get your civilian uh, paddy dive license or your uh, your ACOP um, parachute uh, jumping license and stuff like that and put those on your resume, some medical courses, anything, anything, whether the army provided for you or the Navy or the Air Force or you went out and got on your, on your own city side. Uh, if you had a paramedic license, uh, that would give you points at the board. Just when they sit down and say, okay, we got you know 50 guys that want to go and we're only going to take 30 on selection uh, to try to fill a course of you know 10 or 11 guys, uh, who's going to be our best uh, candidates? And they see that you know they've got those those courses already dialed in. So most likely, you know, you'll be successful because you, you know you already jumped out of an airplane, you already been underwater diving, you already have paramedic or you have medical background. And stuff like that. So I think that's a, a point process that the, uh, the pencil pushers said in Ottawa sit down and look and say, okay, who's, who's going to be successful from the criteria that we've laid out in the, the format to give it points. Gotcha. Yeah. I think at the time I was looking into it, I thought they were saying you really to get selected, you should be a paramedic. And I was like, oh, well, that's a whole other thing I got to do on my own budget and, and time. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. And when we break down this whole qualification of a SARTEC, we'll, we'll talk about your medical background because it, it is step, certainly a step above uh, us as EMTs. Yeah. So for 10, about like 10 years ago for a five or six year window, they had a, an initial program that they take paramedics off the street. If you were a fully qualified uh, uh, paramedic, you could uh, transfer right over, right into it. You'd go and you'd apply, they'd go get your paperwork, same thing. And then they take you, if they were accepted, they take you to basic training and on completion of basic training, you would go out and do uh, selection at Jarvis Lake. And then after that, if you're successful, you'd be enrolled uh, in the SAR program. And we still have members that joined in that uh, direct entry program, they call it. Uh, we still have guys that are serving today. I think the goal of that was to get younger members. And we didn't get a lot of younger members because like you said, it takes a while to get your paramedic license. So we ended up getting guys the same age as everyone else. And I don't know if the program stopped or just kind of fizzled out, but uh, we are, I haven't seen any of the director entries in since I've been in, but I know some of them that are in previous uh, years ahead of me. Yeah. What would you say is the average age of a candidate? So before they actually become a SARTEC? I don't know, man. I feel like it's 30. Uh, we got some guys that are like 25, too, but we don't, I don't, I didn't see any 19 year olds we, because you have to have four years in prior service. So 
just that alone it seems like it bumps up the numbers a bit but yeah mostly I, I was you know 30-ish going through and uh, all my buddies about the same age as me we had a couple guys a bit older right in the 40s uh range but that was like the old guy and the youngest guy of course would be at uh, 25-ish uh, so yeah 25 to 35 I think would be the what you'd see on selection and run through course but there is there a, a cap because you, if you're saying there's a 40 year old that's really cool like yeah. going through this physical demanding training I'm assuming right so yeah I don't know if there's a cap for going on selection but probably not but I know there's uh, the cap for actual operational service would be 60 years so we have a member that completed 60 years a, a couple months ago uh he's been operational for 25 of his military 35 military years right so uh he's still at 60 years old and got another guy at our shop who's trying to that's his plan and goal as long as the body uh puts up and he'll keep going go to 60 is the goal does that mean he's jumping out of helicopters the doing parachuting yeah. at 60 yeah. years old yeah, that's he's insane one of our, he's one of our mountain gurus he's uh you know a lot of corporate knowledge from those guys right yeah so they, they're reservists, so they stay at the base a lot longer. So they're in the reserve force and they don't uh, have to move around. So we keep one guy or two guys at our, our home unit and they don't have to leave. So the, the knowledge of the land, the area and all the train, training areas they can use it. It's uh, enormous what they bring to the shop. So they're really great to have around. That's always key to have somebody that's got that long term exposure and experience in the specific location that you're operating in and i say that potentially is a flaw in the u.s military depending on where you are but you know at our stations everyone's regardless of who you are in the command you're getting swapped over every four to maybe an hour like five to six years but i don't think there's much of an option for people that are there longer term and the folks that are there longer term are like facilities engineering so they're they're working on maintenance around their civilians but they're not operational. They're not there to tell us, oh, like this is the hazards that you might encounter in this location deploying on this mission. That's really cool that you guys have some salty sailors there for that yeah, reference. Yeah. I'm going to call them that from now on. Salty sailors? Yeah, I'm going to call them a salty sailor for sure. Yeah. 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 Salty Steve. <laughs> Shut up, salty Steve. Always talking to you. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So after uh, the paperwork goes, you get selected uh, and they get you, you get a message saying, you know, this date and this date, you're going to come out to Edmonton and do the, do the selection. So that's a uh, like 16 days still felt like, uh, I thought it was 20. I think I was gone home from home for 21 days with the travel on each end and stuff like that. I wanted to get it out there a couple of days early. I had friends told me go out there a couple of days early, get acclimatized at different, different uh, elevation out in Alberta. Um, you know, you don't want to be sleep deprivated, uh, dep already by the time you get there and jet lag from your flight. So it's all the time travel. So I got out there early and got it, uh, you know, acclimatized and then rolled out on selection for the 16 days and then had a couple of days at the end to pack my gear shower and get ready to head back home. So, and you, they tell you at the end, uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, it depends on how many guys uh, you yeah, finished with. We finished with, I was 12 out of 30 of us. And so they took all 12 was their number that year and said, yeah, uh, you guys are going to be, you're found suitable and you're going to be selected. So, uh, that's it. Uh, and then we just went home and waited and waited and waited until, we actually got the, the paperwork and the course message saying you're loaded. So my home unit was asking me to come back in the field and go do an exercise here and there. And uh, knowing we had been in contact with the, our course uh, NCO, which was going to be the sergeant that's taking care of us for the year and running us through all the training. I've uh, been in contact with him saying you guys are going to uh, be coming. The messages are coming. We're just waiting for you know Ottawa to cut them. So uh, yeah, we just kind of waited around and and then finally the messages came and about June, July, I think it was, we were able to start getting our stuff ready and uh, traveled from Petawawa, Ontario to Comox, BC, which is the other side of the country. If uh, you're familiar, basically traveling from uh, New York to Seattle, I guess, is kind of a similar distance. Is there some kind of background noise? I keep hearing like a shh coming in. Yeah, I don't really hear anything. It's like a static. Maybe, maybe. Now, so like where does it really start as in what's the first phase where you're like okay this is make it or break it it's a selection process before we really get into it so what's what would you say is your your buds if you will for a sartec yeah i think that's uh, jarvis lake uh selection so out there you do the a uh, bunch of admin you know get your gear ready stuff like that they make sure everyone's got the same two the same gloves the same pants everyone's all 
you know, so no one's going out into the wilderness with, uh, with limited gear. So everyone's got identical stuff. So no one has an advantage, right? They take anything in Gucci away you have and put everyone back on baseline. Um, like I said, you got guys that had 10 years in the army. You've got guys that had four years in the Navy. So uh, kind of bring it down to an even playing field by taking away all your nice uh, swag. And, and then, yeah, send, send us over to Jarvis Lake, bus you out there. And then selection starts from there. And it's like normal, uh, what you think, uh, selection minus the water because uh, there's no, uh, everything's frozen over, but it's mostly rucksack work, heavy bags, heavy packs, um, snowshoeing. Uh, survival they teach you a bunch of stuff uh you know small small tasks they teach you how to build a survival shelter how to trap and snare rabbits and squirrels and clean fish and stuff like that and they kind of teach you it with lots of sleep deprivation waking up every night uh getting you on random t- uh, navigation tasks and you know they show everyone how to light relight a stove if you if you didn't remember how to relight a lantern and then they make you you know, run around at night, you finding these grid spots and light a stove or light a lantern and for time. And, you know, under stress, you think you're gaining or losing points, depending on how you perform. And there's a bunch of teamwork to see, you know, guys getting frustrated with each other and not being a team player and stuff like that. So the log PT, the normal stuff, we got uh, logs of our fallen, uh, the fallen Sartex who've uh, died in operations or training and their names are carved into the log. So you uh, yeah, carry those around, put them on a stretcher, carry them around, carry them on your shoulders, do, you know, overhead, whatever, stuff like that. What would you say is the most challenging exercise or drill that they have you do physically? It's probably just the navigation at night. Um, so you get have to navigate to, you know, these distant points at night uh, with a bunch of guys, a uh, group of six or something like that, depending on how many are left. Snowshoes, so thick, deep snow through the wooded area with the fallen trees every, everywhere. So it's like a you know, a bunch of crisscross of sticks that you're trying to trip over and fall over. I, I say the hardest part for me was when I fell over with my, you know, hundred pound rucksack is trying to get back up because you push your hands in the snow and they go nowhere. So you know, either have to take your snowshoes off and re reset and then stand up and put your snowshoes back on or try to do, you know, like a single leg s- squat with a rucksack on your back. Um, so that was probably the hardest part, but like I said, I was a bit older too. So some of the young guys didn't seem to have a problem with that. And, telling the old guys to hurry up but all in all I mean that was definitely the worst part was uh trenching through the bush a pretty thick bush out there and up uh some quite aggressive hill hills and terrain that's this is so entertaining as far as yeah this like Canadian survival is yeah. your selection phase exactly. and you're out yeah. there and you're, you're describing the snowshoe section like part of it where I was falling into the snow having a hard time getting out this is like the most this is the most Canadian thing I've ever heard. And it's amazing. Now, yeah. how old are you at the time going through it? Uh, 30. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, 30. Yeah. So like I said, the 25 year old guys were like, do you need help? I'm like, no, man, I'm good. Like, I got it. Just give me a second. Let me get my stuff together. You know, back off kid. I got this. Yeah, I got this. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man, that's cool. So what about physical requirements? Is there, is there anything like you have to do a minimum of 30 push ups to become a PJ or, or something like that? Yeah. So when you first, like when you do your first initial paperwork, there's, um, you apply to Ottawa, you got to do some basic tests. It's like an indoor test. It's not really, uh, uh, anything hard. It's like a treadmill run on a treadmill and they increase the incline of the treadmill every minute for a certain amount of minutes, uh, to a max speed and, uh, out, um, incline with a 25 kilogram, uh, bag on your back of any of some certain variation of bag. It's gotta be a rucksack, like a military pattern one, or it can be some like Arteryx bag. They've got some specs on that of what you can do. And then you do an equipment carry. So it's like a 50 Wait, hold on. Minutes. Let's go back to this this run thing. So do you remember the incline and the speed? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Uh, you only do that test once. And that's the only to do. You have to have that test to apply. Have, send your paperwork originally for the first, very first paperwork. You have to have this gotcha. test. So it goes up pretty quick. Like I did a couple of trials on it and to see like, all right, I want to get a good score. I want to be competitive. Uh, and yeah, it's definitely once you get up there, it's... They, I think every minute or something like that, they incline it up to maximum like 15 degrees with the bag. And then start once you're at 15, they start bumping up the speed. So, yeah. I think the inclines are different depending on where you are in the world. For the most part, I think treadmills in America go up to only 10. And I recall one of the drills that one of our instructors had me do in my airman program was, it was just sprint, so no rucksack or anything, but it was 10 incline, 10 speed for 10 minutes. 20 seconds on 10 seconds off. So it's one of those, you sprint for 20 seconds. You only get 10 second rest. Like you put your feet on the side and get yeah, back yeah. on and sprint. Then you got to get back on it going. 
Yeah, and I remember he 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 knew he because I'm not the best runner, and not regardless of how good you are, I think that's a pretty challenging yeah, test. Yeah. He put a bucket there, and he goes, "I go, what's that for?" He goes, "You'll you know Those you know what it's for, yeah. and you know you're gonna need it." And I was sure enough, like I think I'm minute five. I use that bucket. <laughs> Kept oh yeah, going. That's, yeah, that's a greasy. Yeah, uh, that's greasy for sure. Ten yeah. second rest. That's nothing. You can barely get your wits about you. In 10 seconds, it was right? rough. It was yeah. rough. It was a good drill to like get that water confidence of cooling. It's uh, slowing down your heart rate, which we yeah. talk about a lot in our trainings and stuff. But no, it makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. a fun drill. All right, so so that's one. And then what else? Like, is there any other physical stuff that you have you do much? You do a fifty meter, uh, fifty pound and twenty five pound, or sorry, a fifty and a fifty two pound or kg carry. So you pick up like it's called the unload, loaded unload. So you pick up like a d- set of dumbbells and you run. I think it's twenty meters around the pylon. At the other pylon, you put the dumbbells down and pick up a barbell. It's like a kink bar, like a preacher curl style bar with weights on it, and you run. You walk as fast as you can, or I guess it's supposed to be a not a run. And back the other end, put it down, and then go like with weights then without weights then with weights without weights switching back and forth between the two weights for so many uh reps and then you go to the pool and then you do uh what is it like a six seven hundred fifty meter fin uh swim for time that's the initial one just to put your paperwork in that's that's what you do you only do that once that's the only time i ever did it uh never did that one again and then when you go to uh sar uh selection so when you get out to edmonton they get you in the in the gym there you do a 1.5 mile uh run and it has to be less than 10 minutes 15 seconds then you do 31 push-ups consecutively 33 sit-ups consecutively eight chin-ups a 650 meter shuttle run it's a 20 meter shuttle run back and forth and they like pylons in the gym setup and then you uh you do two rope climbs a six meter rope climb and that portion is all timed so the run's timed up to and you have to be faster than 10 15 and then the time keeps rolling and that rolls your your entire time and that whole thing has to be done in 17 minutes or less uh or you're not successful and then you roll into the pool right from there uh for a 675 meter swim no fins uh any style you want uh, and that has to be done in less than 20 minutes okay well that's yeah. that, that part's not too too bad but that's that's a cool test yeah and it yeah, sounds it like you're, you're explaining it. it sounds like most of the things they're having to do is really practicality as in what you may need to do physically on the job so you know lifting things up walking with heavy weights packs things like that that i mean we'll get into the whole search and rescue par- part of a sartec but it sounds like those are the things that you're going to be needing to do physically as far as surviving and, and getting a, su- a survivor out of there so yeah. that's really cool yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I mean, we did one more test. We did another. And then, so we did our basic fitness test is our, they have a force test that we have to do. Uh, so in the year you end up doing like three different tests of all different variations, but now I just do the one, I just do one test. I just have the one fitness test uh, a year to maintain. Yeah. What is that? That is the standard forces test. It's uh up and downs, like a, like a kind of like a run <clears throat> with some burpee kind of things. Then sorry. <clears throat> COVID. Then it's a sandbag. Yeah, like you pick sandbags up, <clears throat> and like I think it's a meter. Uh, you slam it on a, on a wall and then you drop it and they have to shuffle over to uh, like a meter over and pick up another bag and your foot has to be straddling in between tape on the floor, pick up another bag, touch it and you do that 30 times back and forth. So it's like a shuttle, a jockey, kind of like a jockey shuttle. It's like a simulate a sandbag lift for like an infantry guy, I guess. Oh, cool. um, and then you do a, a sh- what is it? Like a shuttle run. Where you pick up a sandbag and run back and forth with it, stuff like that. So, no swimming anymore, no rope climbing. Um, but there, there's incentive levels, but it doesn't matter. Just operationally fit is kind of the basic. You got to pass it, and it's pretty, mm. pretty easy to pass. It's for everybody in the forces. How come no swimming? Uh, yeah, I don't know. They just not don't have a swimming swim test for us. We got to do a certain amount of uh, water jumps a year and stuff like that. And at one point they talked about, well, you jump in and then operation, like you with what you would bring operationally and then you'll swim, you know, like do a 400 meter swim or something like that, but it's never amalgamated into anything. So yeah, no, no requirement to swim. Once you're in, there's no swim test, uh, but we swim all the time when we're in the water, we get dropped off by the helicopter and, you know, swim around the, in the great lakes as much as we can in the summer when the water's open. So mm, kind nice. of up to you to do it, I guess. So let's get back to Edmonton. What, once you, you done these, like, these tests and stuff. What's that phase all about? Uh, after the test, uh, well, you go out and do all your survival, your, your ground survival, basically out in Jarvis Lakes, so all that snowshoeing and rucksack and that rolls right into it. So you do the, the physical tests or in the pool and all that climb, uh, rope climbing. 
you do it on the, on base and then they pack you up in a Greyhound bus, like uh, and drive you out uh, a couple hours out to Jarvis Lake. And, you know, you basically show up there at the middle of the night and they start yelling at you and send you uh, into cabins uh, to go s- sleep and then wake you up an hour and a half later, two hours later and give you random tasks with very little uh, direction and lots of confusion, lots of yelling. So keep people uh, always guessing and, uh, lots of push-ups, lots of they got pull-up bars out there, they have tires to flip, uh, all that stuff. So pretty standard. They got a rappel tower out there that uh, you know they can near the end they can use that and stuff like that. You said you started with how many and ended with how many? In that so case, it was thirty and ended with twelve. Wow. Yeah, we ended up eleven eleven on course. Uh, one guy had to take an English course because he was uh, French, so he had to stay back a year and take that English course to get his uh, English profile because it's an English course. Why did other f- people fail out? Uh, from the selection phase. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, man, it's, you know, cold feet, frostbite hands, uh, not being ready. You know, <laughs> just met, some guy couldn't. Some guys couldn't light a fire. Uh, if you can't light a fire, they'll. Uh, cut you loose if you can't light a fire in five minutes they can't send you out into the bush so the end of the the selection is it's called a solo man phase well they'll leave you out for four days by yourself and you'll have a bunch of tasks you have to establish your your survival camp so you'll have to do air to ground signals a fire uh your lean to with your parachute um rabbit snares you know no water, way like yeah so you're out there for four days um so they can't send you out there if, uh, you know if you don't pass the fire starting PO check, basically a performance objective and it's a, it's a no go. Right. So what kind of fire are you, are we talking, you, you get a lighter or do you have to uh, you actually... got matches? Yeah. You got okay. matches and you got to be a uh, football size fire in less than five minutes. What's a football size fire? Like, like a football like a ball? Size of football. Yeah. Like oh, a size okay. of football or soccer ball or football, like a, yeah, you know, yeah. size of your head, basically. Um, okay. you gotta have that fire going in less than five minutes. Um, okay. I'm good at that, dude. I, this yeah. sounds like a job for me. Damn, yeah, it's, it's I've job. always, I've always had pride in the fact that I'm able to start a fire in the harshest of conditions, like rain, just these rainforests and winter conditions. So that's really cool. But in the winter, it's cold. It's it's hard on the snow and everything, and you have to have yeah. a good system. Um, that's so. We only cool. had one guy leave because of that, right? We only had one guy that couldn't cut make the fire hack time, so he he had to go. But everyone else is, yeah, they guys just disappear, right? Like it's a selection thing. You don't know you're all numbered. You have a number on it. Uh, so you don't even know what's going on. You know, next thing you know, like, oh, we're number 15 go. Like that guy's just, he just left. And you guys don't say names. Uh, we talk, once we get to like farther on, we start to know each other's names, but, uh, not really like you don't know their names. And like, like I said, if number 15 just left, I never saw that guy again. I never know his name. He, they take him into the building and give him a shower, give him some food and pack his gear. And the next day he's on the bus out of town and you never see him again. He doesn't get what? to come back and say bye or anything. So we're off doing something else. And he just, they just peel him away. And uh, some guys will quit right in front of you, but I think really most people kind of do it behind the scenes. They just slide over, you know, if everyone's like, go get back in your cabins or whatever, everyone goes, runs off or go run off and do your navigation. He'll stay behind. People don't notice, and then you know, I'm pulling. I'm pulling pin. You had a little flag, a little pink flag tape. You had to hand your tape in as you're quit. You're quitting for the quitting flag, or whatever. But you said you witnessed one or, or so quit. Uh, well, I knew the guy with the fire didn't come because it was near the end, and there was only you know like 13 of us left. And at that point, it's easy to you know you've been with these guys now for you know 10 days or whatever, and 12 days, and you're like, okay, you know that guy was. They were giving him a hard time, right? They were all over him. The instructors, you could tell the instructors were on top of them. He was a Navy guy and they were giving, giving the gear. So, uh, you know, they took him out. He failed his first fire test and they gave him a retest and no, nah, he didn't make it. So we kind of, yeah, guess he's gone. He didn't come back and, you know, the 12 of us are standing there ready to get our next group of instructions. And so at that point you notice the one guy that's not uh, with you anymore. But at the beginning, man, when people are dropping like flies, yeah, no clue. I need to have you on our other podcast to talk survival. I have the Wildertainment podcast, so it's all yeah. outdoor based and that'd be cool to get your knowledge as far as a, expert yeah actually i listened to that methods. podcast today oh nice for the first time i was uh, i heard it on your other one and i was uh, going for a run and uh my podcast just kicked up the one i listened to just kicked off and the next one in cycle just rolled in and it ended up being uh that one about leave no trace actually oh yeah yeah, yeah. that one was cute but um we had yeah. one great one a uh, helo crash that was an in- inspiring story and yeah we have just basically anything athletic or outdoor related it's it's pretty fun yeah thanks for listening to that but that would be cool to have you talk about that but what can you just briefly tell me like how do you build a noose for like a like a rabbit snare or something or what yeah is, didn't you say that that they have yeah. you do that 
Yeah, you gotta just snare rabbit. So yeah, it's a, like a, a just have they give you a spool of snare wire, and yeah, you just uh, you know have uh, four inches off the ground. So I have basically your hand hand width off the ground so that the rabbit's head gets caught in it, not their legs. And about the same 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 thing, four inch diameter for the neck, and you hang it in. A, you try to look for a spot where the rabbits are running, and you look into a, a kind of try to canalize the ground, make some sticks and twigs on the other side, so you can get your rabbit directed to where you want him to go. And uh, yeah, and then tie it off to a tree. And well, that's the phase. I, I that's the part I, I'm a little confused about. Like it's basically just a noose, as in it's a circle, right? And yeah, you have a specific knot, so it's tied. It's just like a, it's just like a slip knot. It's on wire, so yeah, you just like do like a, a wire twist with a hole in it, and then feed it back through the hole. Put a little kink in it, so it nice holds its shape. You got to take, you got to scrape it first with like stick or whatever to get uh, to get it curved, and it gets the scent off of it, right? You want to do it with gloves or something like that. If you want to do it with your bare hands, because they'll have your scent on it, so. On the metal. The, on the metal, yeah. They'll have your, so you do your gloves and you rub it with some, some wood. Uh, keep it so it doesn't smell like a human so they don't uh, trick them in there, you know? So cool. And wait, you, you have like a bent branch that will lift? Or what's the pulling mechanism? No, you, we just have it so that when they go in there, it just tightens on them. Uh, you can do uh, some like fancy branch stuff like that. You normally just find a nice you know set of twigs. You can also break the twigs, put them in the ground. First, and then just put it in, you know, just have it hanging in between on some paracord or just use the wire. I would use paracord on selection just because they uh, give you so much paracord and so much wire. You want to kind of conserve each a little bit. But if we're out training and I have a spool of wire, we basically just do all wire now. We don't really need to worry about an extra couple feet of wire being wasted. But you have to, you know, build uh, so many rabbit snares and so many squirrel snares. And, and the squirrel snares are not allowed to be... Uh, operative so they have to be like dummy snares but they have to show that you know how to build a pole and put the the right size and right diameter but they're not allowed to work because whatever for whatever reason i don't know if it's like some squirrel thing we can't uh i don't want to use squirrel anyways unless it's dire straits you know yeah yeah i i watched what's that one show that they had where it it's a it's a canadian show i think right where they have to survive i think it's called survive is that the yeah i think so yeah yeah yeah, that one's sick. And every time oh. they eat something like a rodent that's or like a squirrel ish thing, most of them get sick. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's true. So yeah, you gotta watch that. I got this a buddy cool. that tra- tracks a lot of traps a lot of beaver and we were gonna try went up and try to get a beaver. And I was like, oh no, man. From watching that show, that one lady got sick after eating like a muskrat or something. I'm like, I don't know, I want to eat these beavers if they're you better boil this thing or something. But yeah. He knows what he's doing. He's a trapper, so I trust Are him. you eating these things in, in school in that phase? Yeah, if you catch a rabbit, yeah, definitely eat it. And they catch the, the instructors will catch you. Uh, they'll set a bunch of snares out, obviously, for instructions, right? At the beginning, they take you out. They want to show you how to do it, show you what it looks like. They also get it. Like, they'll get a couple of rabbits, and they'll have a class on how to clean them, how to cook them, what the best ways are um, for nutrition and just maybe sometimes just for flavor. Um, and then they'll, sh- they'll, so they'll, they'll show us all that, and then they'll go out and set the snares up. And at one night, we were walking uh, into into camp and they had a bag full of, of rabbits and just kind of and gave every couple guys a rabbit. So you could, at that night you would sit down and practice your skinning it and cleaning it and cooking up. So we decided to, to roast it on the open flame. It's not as much uh, nutrition, but we had lots of, we had lots of rations some military meals at that time. So we weren't really starving for food. So we said, let's grill it up like a, some nice roasted chicken styles. It takes away the nutrition when you do it over the flame. I thought, it, boiling was the worst. If you boil it, you're going to be able to drink the water and then you'll, uh, you'll have the nutrition in the water. So mm. you can kind of like make a soup. It's going to last longer. So if you're out surviving, a soup would be a better option. Gotcha. All right, let's get away from the whole survival phase. Well, we should, I should yeah, have you on that podcast. Point. So that'd be oh, sick. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So you make it through this phase, big attrition rate here. Now what, what's, what comes next to become a PJ or sorry, a uh, Sartek? Uh, yeah. So you, like I said, you go to Comox and then you start course, right? So you get loaded on course. They'll send you like a package, a bunch of books. So start studying uh, medical stuff. So uh, anatomy and physiology is kind of like the main thing. Start getting your mind into that and see how that works. Uh, and then they send you like the, the course of what, what's going on for the year. So really the main part of it, the big portion is, uh, about whatever, five or six months of medical. So getting your, your paramedic license, uh, basically through them, they see they have a schoolhouse there in uh, Comox at the Canadian Forces Search and Rescue School. And you'll go there, they got a huge training facility with all the medical uh, equipment set up. And so we'll run exactly what the operational SARTEX at the units would run through gear, through all their pen kits. Uh, so this is a, a penetration kit, it's our, what we call our medical uh, bag. 
you know, start running uh, classroom stuff. And then as you start to run through classroom lectures and learning about, uh, you know, the, the different body parts and systems, uh, they'll start running you through scenarios uh, and you start to learn how to be a paramedic, basically, right? They have uh, civilian contractors that come in from British Columbia and they run the course along with uh, the SAR tech instructors, the cadre there at the school. Uh, yeah, you'll just start running uh, doing that. And that is kind of one of your phases. Uh, there's a ground search and rescue phase um, back in Jarvis Lake at the same place doing like ATD operations, chainsaws operations. That's like a week or whatever, like a week long, pretty basic stuff, just that get everyone on the same page. And then, yeah, roll right into medical phase. They've changed the course a couple of times now over the years. What, where, uh, what phase actually lies. I think medical phases first now. So you roll in and right, that's it. If you don't, if you're not, if you're going to fail something, you're probably going to fail uh, academically. You're going to fail the, the medical phase. If after that mm. there's injuries and maybe there's some problems, some guys have some issues like in mountaineering or whatever, but usually if you made it that far along, you'll get recycled uh, back into the program. So they don't cut you loose, but in the medical phase, if you, if you don't cut the mustard, yeah, they'll, they'll cut you loose and probably won't uh, be seeing that uh, those wings at the end of the gate at the end of the, the year. Yeah. How, how long does this medical phase last from start it's to finish? Well, five months, five, six months, kind of started okay. like, you know, like September and ran till Christmas time. So just right before Christmas, we kind of finished up. And you come out of it a fully like street legal and licensed paramedic or just for the forces? Just for the forces. And then you could challenge at that point, we had guys that went and challenged the test over Christmas. You just need to get your license uh, in that gotcha. province or whatever. And once you have your license there, you can challenge it uh, throughout the country. But yeah, we fall under the the military for our license and cool for our practices yeah yeah and i i saw online you guys what's these like acronyms like r2mr r-u-e-t those are phases or something or what yeah is that? so like rtm so restricted team member it's our basic in doc is can consider they're going to be a restricted team member which means they can't fly they can't do anything uh they always need to be supervised they're not going to be left on their own for any reason uh they can't they got a limited skill set at that point and then uh, the next would be team member. So once you finish your, your course out in Comox, which is still another six months of, of phases, uh, which are more, more rapid fire, like fire hose style, back-to-back -back phases. So you come back after Christmas, go to your, uh, your Navy dive course. You'll run, they'll run through that course with the Navy. Now, like the Canadian Navy? Yeah. The Canadian Navy down in Victoria has. Okay. Uh, this, this is where this job really gets cool in my opinion like the, the way i perceive a canadian star tech is all right here's your mission you're gonna we're gonna pack a helo into a c-130 we're gonna fly it out to the arctic or some distant mountain you are gonna skydive onto the mountaintop then you're gonna go through your mountaineering skills and you're gonna ski down you're gonna base jump off that cliff and then you're gonna get into the water and dive for this case that sounds like <laughs> a just, wicked job i want to do that yeah <laughs> Just all encapsulating in one mission. And that's what's so cool. You guys have all of these ridiculously amazing sounding phases. The mountaineering phase, the scuba diving phase, yeah. the, I guess there's a probably a water phase. I see parachute. Para, yeah. 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 So but let's get, let's get into it. So the dive phase, this is like one of the first cool phases yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. So we go prior to Christmas, we go to, uh, to Halifax to do like a helicopter egress training. So I don't know if you ever heard it. It's like you guys do it. Uh, I'm not yeah, sure. we do it. We yeah, do it, yeah. So that's fun. That that's cute. Like, like that's fun in rescue swimmer school. That's yeah. At the end, it's totally at the end. Cause at this point we're rescue swimmers. Most of our time during that course is spent in the water and we're so proficient in the water at that point that that thing is, which is kind of traumatizing or usually slightly challenging for the rest of the air crewmen, like the pilots and the, the flight mechanics, when they go there, it's, it's kind of a big deal for them because it's hard. Yeah, They're sure. flipping you underwater in this big yeah. thing and submerging you. So it's risky, but at that phase for the rescue swimmers, that's like their, their fun play phase, right? They're like, yay, we, we get to go roll around in this thing. And there's always those stupid swimmers that are just underwater holding their breath and going through like the steps in the slowest process and like the the safety divers like can we wrap this up i know you can hold your breath but can yeah, we get yeah. this done <laughs> um but that's always a cool face so, all right so sorry to interrupt so no, no yeah. Was, you, yeah so we do, do that with our like the first one you do we do it with your course mates which is wicked right you go out with half the dudes like whatever 12 guys or whatever right so like six of us go out the next time six guys go out uh on two different serials and it's wicked right you're in halifax hanging out with your course guys you go to do a three-day course in the dunker uh, pretty, pretty good to go. 
Um, and then after that, you got to go back every couple of years and now you get to go with the air crew guys. So you get to go with the pilots and that's where it's fun, where you get to do uh, exactly what you're saying, right? Where you're kind of like messing around more with your, with your buddies, you're always messing around, I guess. So yeah, we come back from Christmas and start uh, um, dive phase. We got dive phase, we got mountaineer, uh, para. What yeah. are the, some of the gnarly drills of dive phase that they have you do? Anything crazy, cool, you have to hold your breath for a while or something? Not really. Uh, a lot of swims, a lot of swims there. So they do a PT test every, every Wednesday or whatever. So once a week, it's a, a 2.4 K, uh, max pull-ups, max push-ups, max sit-ups, and then a swim. I don't know. It was like a 1.6 K slip, swim or something like that with fins in suit around, uh, uh, to a boy and back. And they do these things called awkwards. Well, there's yell awkward out and whatever dress you're in, your dress usually in PT gear awkward wetsuit and you'll run to the thing and the time you, you got to have your wetsuit on with your fins and your, your gloves, your hood and everything. And you got to run down to the jetty where the boats are, get the boats in the, get the boat started, get the flag for diving up in, uh, in a certain amount of time, you know, like four minutes. And the first time you do it, you're like 10 minutes or whatever. Cause everyone's right. You know, no one knows the drill. And then they tell you you're too slow. And then they tell you go back into PT gear and do that. So that's their big game at the, at the the Navy diving units is uh, the awkwards. So they kind of do it for man overboard drills, like on the boat, say someone fell overboard, you gotta get dressed in your gear really quick and go uh, facilitate the rescue. So they use that for uh, like, I don't know, punishment or motivation or something, right? So that stuff's good. They got a big rope ladder, a system, you climb ropes and climb across the ropes underneath, uh, stuff like that. So mm. a lot of PT there, like every day for them. It's really good. They got workout equipment right on the dock that you can hit the, you know, the kettlebells in the rower and go for swims, jumping off uh, high level entries and stuff like that. So mostly just getting intro to scuba diving for the guys that have never been diving before. So, you know, basic stuff, underwater uh, exposure, learn how to use your gear, emergency procedures, taking mask off. So we would have a full face mask. Uh, take that off, put in just a regular regulator with a half mask and exchange the two and do buddy breathing. And then just, you know, getting comfortable with buoyancy, you do some, a lot of day dives and then usually start doing night dives the second week, you know, night dive every, every uh, Tuesday, Thursday, every week till the end of course for five weeks, I think it is. Mm. Now, why are you guys doing this dive phase? What's the idea? How often do you guys respond to cases that involve scuba diving? Uh, just a couple that I know of, uh, out in Trenton, the guys have done a couple dives, uh, over the last couple of years. So maybe one to a year, um, but we have the gear at, at the unit. Um, we stay proficient with it and uh, yeah, we, we go in for a pool dive, uh, last week just to get it out, shake it out. And then we'll do a dive X every year just to make sure that our skills are up to, up to par. And we'll try to incorporate some type of bottom searches and, uh, emergency procedures and stuff like that. Could you share with us some type of mission that involves diving? So, yeah, I've never done a diving mission in the, in the SAR, in SAR. Uh, well, yet, not you, but someone. Yeah. You know, so we had a, a family was out boating um, and they hit a, a big wave going super fast. No life jackets on, of course. Um, everyone went for a ride and one of the kids um, never came up. So it was a boat overturned boat was uh, started sinking the, uh, the police end up showing up with a boat and tied off onto it. And it was kind of dangling in the water. And so the two Sartex on board the C-130 at the time, which is our, our fixed wing asset, uh, parachuted in and dropped uh, dive gear uh, ahead of time, then parachuted to the, to the boat, uh, got in the boat, got dressed in dive gear and went and did a dive uh, on the boat to see if they could recover uh, the lost, uh, the lost uh, child. Dear uh, they God. But yeah, he ended up uh, being found many, many uh, weeks later. Um, oh. Fred had been taken by the the, the tow of the of the pretty deep uh, lakes out there, right in the. Saint Which Lawrence. lake was it? It was uh, part of the Saint Lawrence. That sounds like such a mission. At this point, you know, sad to say, but this victim's probably passed away. Why are they having you guys? drop gear out of c-130 these are just it sounds like such an expensive mission dropping gear parachuting in and then getting geared up on the boat and diving down to try to do a body recovery wouldn't that come to like a different organization yeah well these yeah the rc the rcp so the royal canadian mounted police have a uh, like recovery divers stuff like that um but i mean at this point they didn't have you know the, the boat had just crashed uh, they didn't have confirmation so they were going for a rescue. That 
that was the goal, right? Uh, so if he was stuck in a trapped in an air pocket and something like that, then maybe they'd be able to recover him. Uh, like I said, so we do the, when we do our diving out uh, in Comox, we used to do a confined space rescue diving, so overturn vessel um, victim extraction phase, and that's uh, slowly over the years faded away just due to safety and and the lack of requirement for it. Really, at the end of the day, we've had a couple couple incidents during training, and it just wasn't worth it. And so it's a capability that we don't hold anymore. I don't think anyone in our country holds it at this point. So. It just wasn't being used. And that was kind of one of those examples where you're right, wasn't being used. So the guys got in there and uh, made the effort, but uh, wasn't uh, something that was going to facilitate the rescue at that time. So the objective was to hopefully recover this boy potentially if he was still under the uh, overturned vessel, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I thought, I thought that, but then, yeah, that's crazy though. That's a big mission for or something like that and how long does it take to respond that because that's a big mission to launch that drop gear get in there get on scene dress up go under the boat how long from start to finish when you guys get the call would you guesstimate that took uh i think the guys were airborne at the time so that helps uh -huh. uh, obviously so they start you know whatever wherever they're flying at that moment just you know turn uh turn the gps coordinates and start heading towards uh, the scene and then on route, once you get the information, the guys in the back will start prepping gear, uh, getting dressed. So the, the dive gear is all prepped in uh, Pelican cases, uh, ready to drop. So they'll just have to throw a clip, a parachute on it, throw some tape on it, and then get dressed in their, uh, their dive suits their dry suits or wetsuits, whatever they're wearing at the time, uh, dry suit dive, I think it was just because the fuel contamination in the water. And then, yeah, so they jump, get dressed in their parachute, get dressed in their gear and get ready to go. That's epic. That's yeah. really cool. All right. So that's, so that's dive phase. We were talking about before, yeah. uh, is the next phase. What's the next phase? Yeah. I don't know if I have them in order. It's been a while, but, uh, we yeah. got Arctic, we got mountain phase, we got Arctic phase. So well, Arctic let's get phase. into Arctic. Let's get yeah. in. We've already been like knee deep in Canadianism here. So let's yeah, get into so the Arctic phase. Arctic phase. We jump on a C-130 and go out to Resolute Bay, which is uh, yeah, pretty, pretty far north, not the nor most northern spot you can go, but uh, yeah, pretty north. So we land in there, uh, spend a couple of days acclimatizing, staying in like a hotel and they'll take you out during the day with uh, some, they'll hire some local Inuit guides. We'll go out during the day and just get acclimatized to the weather. So you'll go out and try to learn how to cut snow blocks and uh, how to tell where, which way the wind's blowing, which way north is, which way south is, because the sun's, uh, no, doesn't come up at all, barely. I don't think I saw it maybe breach the horizon once but it stays, it's pretty much dark all day uh, oh my god time of year and how cold yeah. is it i think it was like minus 40 at the time oh like, my god celsius yeah. right but it's yeah, still exactly. oh celsius, yeah. oh my god so Jesus. you know you got the gear you got the big warm jackets there we got the nice uh, boots and all that stuff so we're pretty set up um but yeah we get out there and just get exposed to learning how to you know go out for 20 minutes come back in the hotel for 10 and then start to go out for hours at a time and then we finally uh for a couple of days of that acclimatization acclimatization what, so, what are you getting acclimatized to is it your cold. lungs yeah just your hands and everything because after a while you can be out there with like, like at first i was like man and you know your face is covered up you're covered up your glove your hands in your gloves like you're trying to do everything with mittens on and then after a couple of days once you're used to it you can take your gloves off for a while you can you know have your face exposed and you're not really as long as the wind's not bad, you're not so, your skin kind of gets a little bit used to it, I guess. So physiologically, what's occurring there that you're actually getting accustomed to? Do you know? I don't know if it's just a mental thing or uh, you're actually getting some, you know, your, your skin starts to acclimatize and the blood actually circulation changes. Because I know those like Inuit people that live up there their whole lives, they, man, I was out there last year, we were snowmobiling around and I had the snowmobile my my face was on fire from the wind and the guy was out there with no goggles didn't has his shirt undone his jacket undone and he's just boom, riding at you know 80 kilometers an hour in the snowmobile and i couldn't see because the, the cold was so blinding my eyeballs and this guy's got no goggles on so i think they just get used to it man i think that's just the gnarly all right yeah. so so yeah you got to acclimatize what do you have to do aside from that in the arctic phase yeah, and then you they, they send you get you here's your compass here's your bearing here's your grid go to a place called Crystal City which is uh, another uh, Canadian Forces compound and we start walking out there so uh, we get all our gear that we're gonna need for the next four I think days and we start walking out to Crystal City which is uh, basically a like an ACO trailer for the instructors and a bunch of um, sprung uh, shelter tents 
for the students. So we'll stay out there another couple of days and get acclimatized and then we'll start to go out during the day and work on skills like uh, survival shelters. So we'll start with a, what they call it a survival trench. So, you know, you're out in the Arctic and the blizzard's rolling in and you don't have time to build an igloo or put up your tent. So you need to get in out of the wind immediately and you'll start to basically digging a trench like you would in, in uh, the army, you start cutting snow blocks out of the snow and start building them like a teepee over top. And it's just enough for your body to get inside and uh, basically outlast the storm. So you don't uh, get uh, frozen in the blizzard. Why do you need to build this like TP with blocks? Couldn't you just dig a hole in the, the snow? Just, well, so you don't get buried if it does snow, but like, yeah. you know, just dig it in. Why do you need to build that TP? Yeah, just to keep, stay warm. Like it actually does, it's pretty decent. It keeps you, keeps a little bit of warmth in and stuff like that. And I think this is just a shelter. So it's just another survival, uh, keep you out of the wind, out of the elements. But wouldn't a tube of snow have the same effect? And it depends on where you are on the ground, the, on the land. So this is just kind of flat. Uh, yeah it's harder land to, and you yeah. can't dig in so like so we'll get we get into like a cornice after and we'll start to dig into those but yeah so exactly you're in a flat plane and it's kind of hard to dig under so it's easier and quicker just to take the blocks out and when you take the blocks out you just use them as your roof and uh yeah it's, it's actually pretty quick when you say blocks is this like deeper more snow packed snow that you yeah super packed yeah. snow would it be like a block that's like maybe two inches thick by you know a foot and a half across and a foot and a half deep so it'll come out with these you know, these 18 by 18 blocks kind of thing. And you can use them as your roof. Uh, that's cool. This yeah. is so cool. All right. And we and actually then... had Pete, we actually had Pete, two PJs came up with us up there to Resolute Bay to get ready for their, some Arctic phase they were going to do. So they got mm. sent from Arizona. Said, oh my Canadians. God. Yeah. Here's a, here's some money. Go buy some gloves and some toques. And you're going to go with the Canadians up to, up to Resolute Bay. So how the how did the Arizonians do? They did they did all right. They liked it, man. They had I think they had fun. They were they they realized some of that they should probably spend a little more money on boots or whatever. Bought the bigger boots, but they had their clothing budget. I think they wanted to save a couple bucks. So yeah, they didn't know, right? They no. Know, so w were they pretty humorous about it being from? Oh like yeah, the, they were. The good. Yeah, yeah, they were great. Yeah, bitching about the cold a lot, or <laughs> or just no, like making jokes about it. Yeah, more of that. Yeah, mm. not too bad. And then, uh, yeah, so after that, like you do that, and then you start, uh, and then you build a t you'll put a tent up. So we have like a standard, our survival tent that we carry on the C-130s. So they have that out there. You put that up and then you'll build a, a big snow wall around it. So same blocks, but bigger blocks, same type of snow. And you build it around to protect the tent from, from the wind. Gets a little bit of insulation. So you'll build your tent up with your tent, with your guy, a couple guys in your tent, you know, two or three of you. And then you'll have your lantern and you'll just kind of do like tent routine in the Arctic and see how everything freezes and everything gets cold. And uh, so you stay in the tent for a night. And then after that, we'll start building igloos. Now igloos is this again, blocks like yeah, classic legit, igloo. Legit igloo. Yeah. We got a couple of, uh, of army range, like they're Canadian military Rangers, I guess you call them. Um, so they're, they're natives up North that. Uh, yeah, they, they're basically like a big reserve force that can work uh, for the government. And so they'll come out and meet up with us and show us the lay of the land and they're the igloo specialists. So they'll show us how to build the igloo. They'll kind of do a demo and then you get kind of set with your group of three guys and start building your igloo because you're sleeping there that night. And they'll show you a way to make uh, little lanterns out of a seal fat and uh, stuff like that. Oh my God. So you guys, are you guys killing seals out there? No, no seals. We got to be got pretty far away from the ice where we were. And, um, yeah, so no, no seals didn't see any, we only saw a couple of polar bears at the, at the dump eating garbage, nothing in, uh, where we were roaming around. Let's save some info for, uh, the world entertainment podcast, but still tell me a little bit, how do you build an igloo as far as the, you know, these blocks not falling in on themselves? What's what kind of goes quickly behind them? That. Yeah, it's just about the angle of, uh, you know, making an, uh, making an angle on the corners and having them kind of touch up against each other and they kind of hold each other up oh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. force like that. The hardest part is the top piece, the cap in the center uh, at the very top is like a circle and you have to kind of put it in. It's super hard to get in there. And I mean, man, constantly blocks are falling down. Like you put a block up, you turn to pick a new block and three blocks will fall down. So um yeah it was a but once it's curve. once it's up it really that's oh. the like, last piece solidifies it all probably right yeah and once it's up and you kind of get in there and you got a couple couple dudes in there warm it up from the inside a little bit get a breathe in it'll start to like everything starts to settle in and 
it's not going to collapse on you, but when you're building it and the wall's not finished, it's like, turn your back and the wind blows and, and you might lose a couple of bricks and then you're, you're back at the start there. So I did a Knowles course. Knowles is national outdoor leadership school in America. And what we did, I, I talked about this in one of the world Timmet episodes, but then there's footage of it, but it's basically, we called it a quiglu, right? So you just took the snow and you piled it all up in a big, big mound. And yeah. as you're doing this, it's, it's great when you have a, a team, a big team, everyone's piling snow. One person's in the middle of this snow pile, just packing it down consistently and slowly getting higher and higher and higher as people are throwing snow and just packing it down. And then you dug in from there. And that seems like, I suppose the reason you're not doing that is because you're really in on the ice and there's no snow like that. Cause that seems like a easier and simpler method. Yeah. This snow is super dry and like, it's really hard to dig and shovel. So like when you cut it with, uh, uh, like these little these snow saws, they're called, uh, when you cut it with a snow saw and pull it out, it's like, they come out really easy and you can carry, you know, like these massive, we ended up getting massive blocks out of there when we were building our, our shelter, our wall for around our tent, you can get like a, you know, a two by two by two block that you can like, they stay together. They're pretty solid. And so that was a lot. Uh, we ended up digging. The next thing is to go into, uh, like a cave basically. So on the side of a cornice, you know, the snow blows over and it's all hard there and you get three, got two or three guys and you dig a, a rat tunnel up from the bottom up and then a sleeping platform inside of the, the two or three man shelter. And yeah, you stay there and sleep there overnight. And yeah, it's, uh, that's kind of more the idea. So it's kind of, they kind of like just run you through all the different options, I, th I think. And then depending on you know, where you are. Cause we had to travel a little bit to get to the cornice where there's actually snow enough, uh, deep enough to be able to build the, the shelter that way. So you just remind me, I used to, as a growing up, the only things I would read were survival books. And I re always remembered one thing they would talk about when you're digging into a snow cave or something to have a slight dug out portion at the ground floor part, part of your, your shelter yeah. just for that. What is it? Is it for the humidity and the cold to just cold, stay yeah. down there? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, heat rises, cold stays low. So you want it like even below you. So you have like a little hole below you to, to sleep on. Yeah, it's like that in Igloo too. You have like a, sh a shelf and then the cold zone and then you crawl out underneath the cold zone. So you're actually like kind of digging under the ground to get out of um, the yeah. Uh, Igloo. Yeah. This is so cool. So, but again, what would be a scenario in search and rescue where you would have to build an Igloo? Great question. I don't know. I haven't been one yet. Hopefully I don't have to, but uh, yeah, maybe, you know, plane crash, uh, if, if you're in a plane that has to go down in the Arctic or if you jump in and weather comes in and you can't, uh, you know, the helicopter can't come in to get you or the snowmobiles can't come in to extract and you got to stay there for a extended period with the patient, you know, hopefully we're have a tent and we're able to drop, uh, that stuff. Uh, but yeah, if something happens and you can't get equipment or, you know, the cargo doesn't make the drop zone, uh, and you're stuck there with, uh, either yourself just trying to survive or with a patient, um, someone that needs help i guess you're going to build that igloo's probably a little bit of a longer haul um but yeah this the the two-man shelter would be definitely good to go and the, and the we call it a fighting trench would be uh easy good to go no problem pretty quick and easy to get in there with the patient and someone hypothermia uh it's pretty small quarters so get a couple sleeping bags out there if you can or get your warming gear and snuggle up i guess i'm getting so excited i want to do this job i i think i yeah. I, I, I don't know. I'm really excited about this. This is, this is so cool that you guys do all this. All right. So let's move on from the Arctic phase to, to the next phase. I, I have written down here, winter mountain rescue operations. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a winter mountain uh, rescue, which when I went through, they didn't have, we didn't have the winter mountain rescue going on. It got added another, I think a year or two later, but I ended up going for the, like the, the next progression of it I was able to go for. So yeah, you just do ice climbing and learn about oh ice anchors God. and all that stuff uh, and doing snow, some snow uh, skiing and avalanche stuff. So a lot of avalanche, uh, ASD level one, stuff like that. So again, I keep going back to it, but what would be a scenario where uh, Sartek would have to do some ice climbing? Yeah. So we do mo probably more um, ice rescue, right? So top, you got a helicopter or we're jumping in, hopefully top down, but just getting guys comfortable on the ice really is the main goal, right? So I don't want to be standing topside with crampons and ice axes uh, and you have to use <clears throat> ice screws to put them into ice uh, to go and do a, a rescue from a patient that's below me without having the skills and knowing how to move in the, in that environment. So I think that's more, more relevant to just get you comfortable. Not everyone showed up knowing how to ice climb or ever had been on ice. So it's that intro to be, all right, we're going to expect you to put on crampons, get ice axes, get ice screws, 
from the top, rappel down with all this equipment to a patient to facilitate a rescue. Um, so you got to be comfortable on the ice and climbing it is a little bit more difficult than rappelling. So I think that that really helps to add that, that skill set in. So we still do it for training. Do you ice climb on your own time? Uh, no, I don't, I don't have a lot of time for that. Uh, yeah. just, I don't have a lot of free time. So I, I do, when we have uh, opportunities at work, I, I jump all over them. We try to go every year. You say you don't have a lot of free time. Is that because you guys have so many flights and how does that operate? Yeah, I got two kids, a wife. Uh, so that burns up a lot of my I'll, time. I'll do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. So my wife, not a, she doesn't want to ice climb. So that kind of leaves it out of that. So I would take the family skiing, skiing or whatever the kids and the wife can hit the slopes, but, uh, yeah, they, where do you go know, skiing in Ontario? Uh, Calabogie, Packingham. We usually go to Tremblant if we can. It's in, you know, Tremblant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah try yeah. to go to Tremblant. So that's, yeah. that's pretty, to. how long did that take you to get there to Tremblant? Four and a half hours from Trenton. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a big dark. resort over in near Montreal and Quebec. There. Yeah. So you got lots yeah. of great ice climbing up there. So that's what we'll do is head up there, ice climbing, go for a couple of days of skiing, do some avalanche refreshers, kind of repeat the same stuff that you do on the star course, try to repeat that in the unit throughout your uh, years on just currency and evolution of training, just to keep your skills up. Yeah. So cool. So in that winter uh, mountain rescue phase, you're actually really doing like a little downhill skiing too, or. Yeah. Yeah. I have ski instruction. Um, some downhill skiing, uh, tour ski tour. So we do a lot of skinning and stuff like that. If you're familiar with, uh, skinning, it's where you have yep. to put like these felt, uh, liners on your skis and you go up uphill on skis. So yeah, we do some skinning, some ski instruction, a lot of avalanche, uh, stuff. Um, yeah, because we, we go out to those environments to train and if we're out there uh, with someone in, in distress, then we could end up on the ground, um, you know, at the top of a cliff with avalanche danger below us or, ice climbing requirement or ice, snow and ice or glacier uh, travel. We do glacier travel as well uh, on that course. Got some cool stories of Sartex responding and, and doing stuff like that. Uh, no, because because I haven't been out west, I don't really hear about that stuff a lot. So apparently they had a big rescue last week, I think, but uh, I haven't ended up talking out with any of those guys. It was uh, some type of rope rescue. Now some I type I of what rescue? Some rope rescue that they had uh, out in the, out in, a west west coast but i'm not sure exactly what the the whole scenario was but yeah they apparently they had something something go on last week man this is cool i'm dude in my opinion and i hope i'm not upsetting anybody on the u.s side i think this sounds so much cooler than um, then again pjs do a lot of this type of stuff that's diversified but as far as the stuff that a helicopter risk swimmer goes through I mean, we're just in the pool all the time, holding our breaths underwater, on the water, just getting drilled and beaten down. And we become water dogs. We're proficient. But man, this sounds way cooler. You get to see everything and do everything. Yeah, I think it's pretty similar to what PJs, like pretty similar to the PJ world. We're not yeah. uh, combat related, so we don't have any tactical aspect. We carry uh, weapons uh, on the aircraft for uh, wildlife defense and personal defense. We don't carry them for any tactical stuff. We're not... Uh, deployed overseas um we've had some guys go down to haiti or something to do some disaster relief but yeah we're not deployed in a combat role at all our, our stuff's bright orange we're, our helicopters are bright yellow and our planes will all soon soon be bright yellow as well so yeah pretty high visit stuff and we're yeah we're staying in canada um anytime we leave canada it's for training uh so they're in the states for training but not a, a operational deployment over overseas in afghanistan iraq stuff like that it's uh, it's not a thing for us so a little yeah. different, right? If you want to do that stuff, that's you're not going to get it here. So hopefully you did it before or you just don't have that itch anymore, I guess. Yeah. Now, us Canadians like to be flashy with all our uh, our stuff. And I, I'll put some pictures up on YouTube for anyone tuning in as far as, yeah, the just the airframes look different. They're all brightly yellow. And my one of my cousins is, I think she works for fisheries. And she I remember she labeled you guys something really funny. Oh, like, oh, you want to be... An orange pajama person or something because okay, I yeah, mentioned yeah. it. I, yeah, I don't know what's what's the nickname of. Uh, we were always called uh, orange uh, flying cheese Cheetos or something like that in Comox, <laughs> I guess, because we got our parachutes are our canopies are bright orange and our suits are full. Uh, our flight suits are, are bright orange. So yeah. everyone said that. I didn't hear that until I got up to Comox to the kids and say, "Oh, they're the cheesies, the flying cheesies." <laughs> so it's, it. it's literally the color of a of an orange cheesy. So. Yeah, you guys are bright for yeah. sure, which is cool yeah. and and easy to find. It's all yeah. search and rescue. If you guys get in distress, then at least hopefully they can find your bodies or or pin you down. Yeah, um, exactly. That's one thing I always thought was 
a slight flaw in potentially in the Coast Guard. They're all dressed in navy, like dark navy blue. And yeah, for yeah. the most part, operations in the Coast Guard are not necessarily law enforcement or tactical, right? So you don't need to be blending in. You don't need to be in camo. But if you fall in the water, if a Coast Guardsman, a regular Coast Guardsman on a boat in his operational dress uniform, blues like it's just yeah. dark navy blue, dark blue falls in the water yeah. forget it like you're a hundred percent the color of the water you're done yeah. the, like but at least maybe a pj maybe you could be found in in bright orange or something so yeah that's cool well, I'm, we were on the side of a, of a mountain do some training and the helicopter flew by we were in our, our our green our army style stuff that was like you know left over and we were waving at them and they flew right by the next that night we saw them we're like hey do you guys see us no we didn't see you the next day we put on our orange jackets they flew by yeah, they, they're like, okay, yeah, we could pick you out like on the mountainside, no problem. So it was a good, like, yeah, okay, maybe we shouldn't be wearing that cool uh, army stuff that we used to have back in the day. Maybe we just retire that or wear that as an underlayer and keep the high vis stuff on top. So the hel- yeah. I mean, you're flying in a helicopter, they could be, you know, three, 400 feet above. So them looking down at the, at the trees, trying to look for someone in black or green, you know, same when we get a mission as some, someone's wearing a black shirt and a black jeans and they're in the water. Uh, great. Right. Like this is going to be a long search because it's hard to find those people. Yeah. Note to self, anybody doing recreational sports, like ski touring way out there or mountaineering, maybe consider your next little outfit being slightly flashy in yeah. the instance of a search and rescue case, uh, versus like a white, I, I used to ski with a white jacket. I was like, well, if I go head down or like, you know, either way, yeah. like <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to be bad. Hardly to find me. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Let, let's finish up your training and then we'll get into yeah. the, the good old search and rescue cases. But um, sea survival, that's another phase you guys go through. What is that? Yeah. Sea survival, that's in Colmox at the sea school and they run all the air crew through there as well. So all the pilots and stuff like that go and do that course. Um, the StarTechs that run it still. And yeah, it was just, uh, you know, egress in the water, how to use your, your life inflation vest, how to, you know, if it doesn't inflate, how to operate it, if, if something goes wrong, how to get together as a group, how to uh, get a life raft inflated, how to, how, what the procedure is to do it, how to get in it, how to survive. Uh, we have single man life raft as well, or single person life raft, I guess. Uh, we jump in that and sit out there for hours and they, you know, go through the, the drills and the procedure. Um, yeah, some basic stuff like that, get in your suits and, understanding the cold uh the water uh, environment we also do a, a parachute egress training when they do it there so mm. you know you jump in the water and your parachute lands on top of you how to swim out um if you end up in the water with your parachute harness on you how to get out of it properly and stuff like that so they'll tow you behind a boat and then just like cut you'll be hanging on a on an a-frame and then just cut you away and you'll drop in the water and you'll have to uh, action action all your drills and get out of that so you can free yourself That's from cool. your harness it's a couple i think it's like a week long it's not super long yeah it's a big uh course or big test in rescue swimmer school is the parachute test and we had a navy rescue swimmer on the podcast a couple weeks ago yeah or months ago at this point um and they're really specialized in those operations right because they're usually are at least often launching off of these big boats and on aircraft carriers. So, you know, the airframes are coming in and out and their job is to be there and launch if one of the pilots goes down. And usually if they're going down, they, they've launched a parachute. So yeah. it was cool talking to him about oh, it. Yeah. And he was really adamant about the steps because we, <laughs> we've been out for a couple of years and we yeah. were trying to run through a little bit. It, it was a very methodical process as far as what to take off at what time, when to cut certain things and, uh, whatever. And we were kind of briefly running through it in that episode. And he was like, mm. he was like correcting us. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but it is important because it's a big risk when you get wrapped up in a parachute and yeah, sure. uh, your, your story remind me of something actually, uh, as far as inflating vests and like that being in that, that phase, I remember in swimmer school, you know, we have this, we are always swimming with our gear. We call it like our tri uh, tri harnesses. And so you inflate it, right? You got that toggle and it's a CO2 cartridge that just blows this thing up within two seconds in case of panicking, or you just need the flotation of it. But that said, when you're going through this swimmer training, you never inflate it, right? You don't need to, because you're, you're doing underwaters and you need it to be not inflated. And so one thing in swimmer school that they always harp on is keep your hand on that toggle, that switch to make sure it doesn't accidentally inflate or otherwise an instructor will come and pull it. Okay. And if you accidentally clip it and it inflates, then you have to scream out. I think it's accidental toggle inflation. <laughs> and then you're an idiot and you got to do a lot of push-ups. That said, I recalled, 
at one point, I, I think we just came out of a drill. I forgot to put my hand there immediately. And it's funny. Sometimes students will put their hand there as an instructor's going to grab it. And then the student's hands on top with the instructors and they're like, let go of my hand because <laughs> they're pretty aggressive. But anyway, um, at one point I got it pulled by an instructor and I forgot, you know, and then I did my pushups, deinflated it to an extent. And a couple of days later, you know, you always, or at least I, I think I had that same harness. I'm swimming underwater. And I was like, oh, there's still some air in this vest. So I'm underwater. I was like, let me see if I can get a little, a little more oxygen on this underwater drill. <laughs> and I'm underwater and I suck on the hose. Yeah, I suck on the hose. <laughs> and just the remaining CO2 that's stuck in there goes into my lungs. I'm underwater 12 <coughs> feet deep, just going like, yeah. my lungs are on fire. I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like so stupid. Yeah, just coughing underwater. Yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah, and resurfacing like, I am an idiot. Like, <laughs> these things are on fire. And yeah. So nah, note to self. That's gross for sure. Yeah. Not, you guys were in the red, is that the red harness you were wearing back then? Like, it, Yeah, that the orange it's like reddish orange. Yeah. It's not the buckle yeah. in the, like a hoisting buckle in front. Hoisting. Yeah. We get, there's the, your clip, like your, uh, like that, that rather large carabiner. And then yeah. you also have right below that you have a connection piece. That's usually what you get hoisted on. The yeah, other thing is for like survivors and whatnot. So we, I, yeah. I'm not, I'm guessing it's the same one you were using, but we had the same one. And, uh, when I went down to Florida, that's the one they had there. A little couple modifications we have on ours, but yeah, same, same harness. Yeah. No, I saw a picture of you guys and yeah, that's one thing I noticed. I was like, oh yeah, it's the same harness. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, cool. So, and then you have mountain rescue phase. I, it's so many like outdoorsy things, right? Like, you yeah, have, that's like a summer, yeah. summer version of the, the winter one. So it's rock, uh, rock only basically. So we do, you know, rock climbing, uh, top rope lead climbing, stuff like that. And then mountain rescue. So setting up, uh, anchors up top and then doing a, like, lay down and repelling and picking off patients on the on the side so basically have yeah, you guys lead climbing uh not on the f not on the initial program but yeah like once you do your upgrade you'll you'll cool. lead climb yeah so i think you have to climb a uh like a five six or something like that you have to follow so they'll have the instructors lead it and when you're going through this phase you'll have to follow uh behind clean clean the gear and get to the top and then uh man you know manage the blade on the ground clean the gear on the way up and then uh, switch over to the anchor on the top side and then keep going. You can do multi-pitch or whatever or the route um, they pick for you that day uh, for your test. And, but you will do a bunch of climbing throughout and then yeah, a bunch of uh, patient will dangle our buddies over the edge and then, you know, do the scenario, go pick them up. So we'll build the anchor, send down the, the team. They attend it with the Stokes litter um, or a rescue sled and go down and pick up packets of patient. And then you can either go down or come back up. And so we'll go through all that stuff on, on that portion uh yeah mostly rock face stuff now what are some funny stories that you have pertaining to like some of these schools as far as things that happen you know donkeys as we call them as other candidates are making mistakes uh i guess we were out climbing on one of the spots i forget the name of there's so many spots out and now in alberta and jasper we're climbing on one of the spots and my buddy's up there uh my buddy nick's up there climbing and he gets this spot and he's like, I can't go anymore. We're we, him and I were like, we're not climbers. It wasn't our thing. We're good with ropes, not good climbers. He climbs up. He's like, I can't get there. And my course, uh, NCO. So like the guys in charge of everything, uh, JP Benoit, he's at the bottom and just trying to coach him through like, okay, put your, put your right heel above your hand. There's a hold. You can get that hold there. And Nick's at the top. Like, man, I can't like, what are you talking about? I, I'm looking at the rock. I can't see anything on my feet. I'm staring and holding this rock. So he's like, no, I'm done. Bring me down. It comes down. Another guy goes up, this guy Joe goes up, climbs it, gets there, kind of has some trouble, kind of gets a little coaching, passes it, goes through. He goes up. Well, Nick's mad at this point, right? He's like, what the, man, come on. Joe made it, I didn't make it. Joe comes down, well, it's my turn to go. So I get there, I get past it, same thing. Nick's, now Nick's furious that he didn't get past it, right? He, I gotta go, I'm going, I'm getting past this. Uh, needless to say, Nick's a very driven individual and now he's crushing it. He's bouldering every day, out climbing all the time, but. That day he was not a happy dude. He was quite pissed and we just wrote him the whole time for it. Yeah, we all did it, man. You're the only guy who didn't do it, you know? He's like, but now, yeah, he's out climbing all the time now. He saw his weakness and made it his discipline, right? Yeah, that that is how it is. Like, I'm afraid of heights and I, I tend to rock climb a lot. Like, I, 
it's one of the things I love to do. I still, I'm still intimidated by it, but uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Climber by default by ego. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm crushing it. So yeah, that's funny. Yeah. What 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 else as far as like the winter stuff goes? Any other predicaments you guys get into? Uh, nothing crazy in the winter. No, no, it's pretty good. Pretty pretty mellow. Like uh, yeah, we had good good dudes. No one fell in any crevasse. No one did anything crazy. Uh, same with Buddy Joe. Man, he would everyone's packing for this big trip out to the ice fields. We're going to the Wapta ice fields, which is a, a pretty cool spot in the Columbia ice fields. And there's all these huts. So there's, I think there's four huts uh, placed out throughout the glacier. And so you ski to the hut, you sleep in the hut and you can stay in that hut the whole time, or you can go to new huts. So we, we had been going from hut to hut and had this little trip that they had planned out for us, the instructors. And we all brought food. We brought, you know, trail mix, you got your cliff bars, whatever. Joe goes to Costco. Uh, it's like a, a whole food store, like a big giant, no, we had, they have them in America. Everyone, yeah, yeah we know. Everyone what knows what Costco yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. And he buys like the three pack of sausage, like the pepper one, the regular one, and the one covered in I don't know, these red spices. He buys the three pack of these massive Hungarian sausages, and that and he brings that and cheese. That's all he brings. He's a mountain. That's that's his mountain meal. So every day. That's my mountain meal too. Yeah, he's got his he's got his knife out and he's just trimming off slivers of of meat, and that's what he ate the whole time, and it was. It was quite comical, man. He just carried this. He probably packed the lightest amount of gear. He had barely anything on. And then, uh, so we skied the walk to the, whatever, the three-day trip or something like that. And we make it back to the bow hut. Final day, which we didn't think about on the way up. Because when we're up, we're skinning up these massive hills through these trees, whatever, side to side, going through all this stuff. And we get, you don't know, think about it. Then you keep skiing on this flat ter- flattish terrain for the rest of the time. And now we got to ski from the bow hut back to our vehicles where the car, the parking lot is. And no one realized on the way up how steep it was, but on the way down for a guy who had never skied in his life, some of my buddies had a backpack on that probably 50, 60 pounds. And now they're skiing. Uh, so one, one of the guys, he just would ski in a straight line until he couldn't, didn't want, didn't want to turn and he would just stop and smash the side of the hill and fall. So you'd be skiing along doing your thing. And you'd hear this guy yelling, coming in hot. And he just fly past you and then bail. <laughs> And like, yo, dude, are you okay? He's like, oh yeah, that's why I turn around. And then he just <laughs> flip around and start going the other way. And he just did crisscross cuts down, down the hill. Just slam every time you need to stop. He's falling over and falling over. So <laughs> just that's awesome. So and we're like, at the end of it, we end up writing like, hey, you should take us out for skiing lessons before you uh, just throw people into this. Like some guys have never skied their life. And you just threw them on the hill with 60 pound bags and said, have at her, right? So can you imagine fun. that guy's on a like at, at, with that skill level was on a case <laughs> he's just yeah. like survivors down there injured i'm coming in hot <laughs> <laughs> yeah I wouldn't, feel, I wouldn't feel like there's a lot of confidence if i was on the ground and someone did that i'd be like oh man this is not a good day you got him in a sled same thing we're going yeah. we're gonna go in hot we're gonna bail and then we're gonna <laughs> yeah. we're gonna keep we'll going we'll <laughs> yeah we'll Might be there a fast bruised when you get there but you'll be you'll be on the ground came in with a femur fracture going out with two <laughs> yeah yeah so, no, it worked out it worked out by the end of it but uh, yeah it was pretty comical man uh just the ski portion of it it was fun good trip though great trip man that's like a one in a lifetime trip to go ski the wapta for work i mean that's i, I mean I, I didn't know there was a job out there that provided that so super happy to do it one of our um one of our old chiefs set it up and i think they're still doing it to this day going out there doing a couple of the huts at least if not all of them i think too uh, in my own experience and you know it varies you, you'll get this in america and in canada but i've always found like us canadians to be quite lighthearted, uh pretty pretty comical and you know willing to have a, a good time yet professional when required as well um yeah so i'm sure yeah you guys have a riot in these different types of of schools and trainings yeah it's it's inspiring and i yeah hats off to you for for what you do um as far as Oh, what did I want to ask? I had a good old question lined up here. Whatever. Um, yeah, what, what's the re- most remote station, though, as far as you guys operate out of? Uh, that'd be uh, Gander, Newfoundland. Uh, yeah, out there, they've oh, got a, a smaller unit. Uh, it's like a half shop, I guess. It's got uh, 10 guys or so, and they just fly the uh, one helicopter. Uh, they don't have any fixed wings, so it's just rotary wing. It's more like a kind of like a Coast Guard station, I guess. They're, they're Marine. Um missions is pretty much what they run almost exclusively They'll, they can obviously respond on land but yeah they're pretty much a marine uh unit that they run out there so newfoundland like you're saying they operate what they deploy into the cold waters of yeah out there. boats mostly boats uh, i mean they'll pick people up in life uh, life rafts and whatnot but yeah a lot of uh people on boats uh 
fishermen and in just injured in distress or whatever, stuff like that. Yeah. Do they also have to operate with like those, uh, Inuits as well? Uh, I don't know if they do a lot of Rangers out in that area. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, coastal waters and more. They did get a couple of climbing, some climbing stuff out there too. There's some, some ice climbing in that area in the winter and stuff like that. So they definitely got some good parks in Newfoundland. There's some beautiful, uh, trails that people can get lost on and fall down cliffs, uh, you know, and be in, be in distress. And then depending on the nature of the call, it, uh, be fire police. And after that, there's not really much else to call. Right. So they will call, uh, the SAR, um, to come out. So that's when you see your mountain rescue stuff in those regions too. Is it in Newfoundland that they have that big Native American like reserve that's apparently so beautiful, like in the Northern part of it? I'm not sure. Yeah. They have some bunch of parks up there. Uh, I haven't been there very much. I've only been out a couple of times more in uh, Gander or St. John's, but yeah. Yeah. Really, some of the, I mean, so Canada is so vast uh, up North that a lot of untouched land. So there's tons of hiking trails and lots of, you know, snowmobiling and stuff like that. So with the weather at Newfoundland, if you're out uh, and get into trouble, there's not much that's going to, you know, get to you besides a helicopter, I guess. Yeah. The park's called the Thorn Gat Mountains National Park. I think okay. way up north there. And apparently it's just it's phenomenal mountains and super remote and you need to yes. have a, yeah, yeah, you need to have a native guide to okay. even access it or something like that. So it's, yeah, that's, I'm not that's sure if it's in the same stuff. park as uh, a Mount, Mount Thor. It's one of the largest elevation changes in the area. So uh, I've never been out there on the ground, but we took the C-130 out and flew around and, and did mm-hmm. some mission analysis stuff just because we were trying to get a jump, but without uh, helicopter support, there's no way uh, we could jump in without having mm-hmm uh sometimes someone coming to pick us up so what's that like huge apparently there's a place where the walls the rock walls are bigger than like el cap and yosemite i forget where it is it's not in in uh newfoundland but it's like i want to say it's off the hudson bay or something like that it's, it's hard to, i don't know i've heard thunder bay has got some good ice climbing but i'm not sure about how big those this is than, rock climbing um yeah i don't know if they, they must rock climb in the summer as well up in, up in that area but yeah whatever this is this is like apparently like it's the biggest in north america as far as like a sheer rock face goes and yeah. I, I wish I, I i knew the name but i'd love to make a trip out there if i could no, survive cool. it it's, it's yeah so for cool, sure man. um let's talk about the the, the cool little nitty-gritty of the operations side of things you guys i know i know like folks that have flown and done like cross service stuff with you guys. They've flown yeah. in your aircrafts. They're like, whoa, their stuff is way cool. It, it, you know, comparable to what like the the Coast Guard was flying with. Thanks, man. That's a compliment because we think our stuff's old, right? We're like, ah, oh, your stuff's better. And then we get down there, we're like, oh, maybe our stuff's not that bad. You know, like you know how you always think something's be- the kettle's always better on their side, grass yeah. is greener. Like, nah, maybe it's not the same. Yeah, I've heard that same thing. Yeah, you guys are operating on older aircrafts. And that said, the, the Dolphin airframe, the 65, is an older airframe. It's certain yeah. They keep updating it and like HH whatever the, the new model is. Uh, but that said, it, it's based, I think it's a French frame started in the 70s or something like that. So, but yeah, you guys are operating on a huge, let's talk to like the helicopters. What is it? The, is it the Griffin that's the very big one? No, so the Griffin's the smaller one. Uh, okay. It's a Bell 412, but yeah, the the Comorant's uh, uh, the Gusta Western 101. That's the large helicopter. So it's got the ramp, and uh, yeah, it can fit you know like six people on litters, no problem. I think the capacity is like 20 people. Uh, I've been on there with you know a bunch of people. Uh, they got seats that they can reconfigure and take off. It's three engines. Yeah, it's a beast. Uh, quite powerful. It's our marine helicopter. It's can de-icing. Uh, anti-ice capability to fly out to, you know, 600 nautical miles out to to sea and stuff like that. So that's our big beast for sure. What are de-icing capabilities? How does that operate? uh, So it warms up the the blades will warm so they can shed the ice. So you don't accumulate any ice on the, on the blades. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And the windscreen and stuff like that, I think and pitot tubes and whatever to make sure that they, all the instruments work and they can still uh, fly and the tail rotor, uh, obviously. Uh, Yeah. That'll heat, it warms up so that the ice doesn't accumulate on it. Mm. Yeah, these things are huge. I, I keep like looking at the pictures and I know they're even bigger in person than they yeah, probably look. Yeah, they're massive. They're giant. They're like uh, what your Marine helicopter looks like, like your Air Force One style stuff. They're they're quite large. 
Yeah, can, can't you guys actively stand at the door without opening any hatch or anything? You can just literally stand, be fully standing at the door. Yeah, yeah, almost. exactly. Yeah, you pretty much, as long as you're about six feet, you can stand with your helmet on almost in anywhere in the helicopter. Uh, no problem. Well, that's yeah. cool. Now you got a full uh, patient uh, station on it. It's got like a, a stretcher that roll, can roll in and roll out and lock into the floor. Uh, you can have, a, it's got a big equipment rack for gear. Uh, yeah, you can take a nap on the floor if you're a uh, long transit out somewhere, uh, something like that. So, like the same stretcher that can fit in an ambulance with the, with, you know, the, the, wheel, yeah. the rising wheels can fit in the helicopter and lock down and be safe. Yeah, exactly. And have tons of, and more space for multiple more patients on the, on the, on the ground. And people Whoa. And see. What's, what's like the most you've heard as far as survivors going on one of these cormorants? <sighs> it's like 27 or something like that. Whoa. Well over capacity, but I think they were on... It was a few years ago, the boys were out in the uh, East coast on the boat when they were picking, a boat was sinking and they were just picking people off the boat and filling up the, I think it was just like on a bus standing room only. And everyone was just jammed in there. What, what were they doing? Like a basket rescue for that? Or? Uh, I think they were doing a hot, uh, ho- uh, ho- like a horse collar, double ups. What's that? What's a horse collar? I don't know. A if horse you collar, it's like a, re- a rescue sling. Okay. Like a, yeah, you, I think we call it the quick strop for us. It's like, it's yeah. just a cinch down. One rescue mm-hmm. goes down, puts him in that. So the strap goes underneath their arms, he pins the yep. arms down and hoists them in and out quick. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cause like a carabiner, so you can hook it into the hook with you or into yourself. And then yeah, I can either go over top of their head or go around their, uh, underneath their arms. Yeah. Just, and he did that for, for how many people again? Uh, apparently it was 27. I, I, oh only, I talked to the guy that did it and we were just, uh, this was a couple of years ago that we talked about it. And yeah. So, I mean, I've heard of, I've been in the shop when they had, I think five patients in the, in the helicopter, all litter patients on the floor. Um, so that can, I mean, you being in the helicopter, you're like, yeah, five people, you can fit them in here. No problem. Uh, easily, easily. Yeah. So yeah, when we go for training, we'll take, you know, a couple extra guys, no problem. Uh, easy to throw extra dudes in. So we don't have that that uh, helicopter at the station I'm at now. So that's the one that I was at prior. And so we want every, all the units, so Gander, uh, Greenwood, Nova Scotia, and Comox all have that same helicopter. And Trenton uh, at 424 is the only- Where, Where's uh, Comox? Uh, Comox is in BC. That's, oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, located in the same place at the school. The okay. same, Wh- the same which place. is where in BC? It's Comox, BC, so it's on the island north of uh, Victoria. Oh, yeah, yeah. Two, two and a half hours north of Victoria. Is it beautiful there? Yeah, it's super beautiful. Yeah, very yeah. nice. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, so yeah. the place I'm at uh, in Trenton is the only place that has the Griffin, uh, Dolph 412. So uh, it's a bit smaller. Uh, we've got it configured a little different because we have it set up. And this is the same helicopter the Army, our Army uses for a ta- tactical flying. Uh, but yeah, we've got a, a SAR box, we call it, with a bunch of medical gear and a, and a stretcher that that kind of goes on the ground, but it's really like one patient max kind of thing uh, in a litter and maybe two or three, if you have to hoist in do any operations like that. It looks like a comparable size to the one that we I flew in the uh, dolphin. So the yeah, 65. I would say the dolphin and that are, are similar. And then the, the Jayhawks and the Comoran are more similar. I think Comoran's a little bit bigger and like same thing. The Griffin might be a little bit bigger, but just can, just a different config. We don't have that door that flops open on the top, which you can't stand up. So it's a, you got to sit in the sill and then, uh, yeah, same thing. Single hoist, uh, one hoist uh, operation, two engines. So not a ton of power. So we don't do a lot of marine uh, stuff. We don't go far out to sea, but we do serve the Great Lakes. So we're in the, we're in the water, over the water all the time. But, Wait, so uh, hold on. Let's back it up. You said single hoist that's right because the is it the cormorant that has Double. two hoists yeah, yeah we have no capabilities or i'm not in the coast guard right now anyway so i can't yeah. even say we but um we had no capability and still to this day the coast guard does not have any capabilities of double hoisting let's talk about that how does that work as far so as it's just an inboard and outboard hoist and all it really does is if you have a hoist fail of some type that you can continue on with the mission right so if something goes wrong with the hoist on the inboard hoist you can switch to the outboard hoist um and yeah so that's pretty much it uh that's the the purpose of it we don't use the two at the same time it's uh, a backup for if one had a, a fail of some type um so in the guardian when your cable breaks you can just send down the other one boom good to go you got your got your guy you can actually do a procedure uh if you're on the cable and it stops working they'll send you the other cable uh and you can do the transfer right on so it's always transfer that you have to practice annually and do like a little currency check on it and how is this set up like it's you said one's in 
inboard, you said? Just or? ones in closer. Yeah, like just ones okay. in the front and ones out far. Oh, Lord, so gotcha. That's it. And, and they're just, they both have their own little engines kind of thing? Exactly. And they both have their own dog. He's got like two toggles in the back. Like I'm guessing cool. your winch man has a has a yeah. hand, hand toggle. So he's got two different toggles, one for the inboard, one for the outboard. You guys call on a winch man? <laughs> uh, no, that's just, a, I guess, a more common term. We call him a uh, flight engineer is who uses the hoist, okay. is the hoist operator. And he does a lot of other stuff too. He's fuel calcs and center of gravity and all that stuff. He's, uh, making sure checking, uh, instrument checking and running through any emergencies is his role too. Yeah. No, we call them flight mechanics. Um, yeah. Yeah, flight yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's cool, man. That's it's, it's cool. Like the, 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 the small differences that you guys have, but, um, bigger capabilities. Yeah. yeah. As far as, as far as the guardian goes though, like we've talked about that too. And like cable cutting, well, a, like the flight mechanic, hopefully <laughs> would have just asked to get lowered. There's no need to drop the, the senior chief from so high, but second of all, <laughs> as far as like actual operation, uh, troubleshooting for that there's this device that they have and it you you would cut the wire uh whether it's like with the shears or with uh cable cutters or whatever you cut that yeah. and then you you re-splices you re-splice it in this like device uh, really cool yeah, I've, never, I've never seen i've never heard of that yeah with a hoist hook at the end so it's like <clears> re-thread <throat> it and just just the friction of it being passed through uh cool. is is good enough and then but then you're you're operating with shorter cable, but you should yeah. be plenty long. Uh, to- I've never seen a cable damaged uh, like that. We've we've had yeah. hoist fails. I, we had one uh, hoist failure the other day um, yeah. where the hoist came up and it uh, rat cage uh, rat, rat nest and it all just jammed up on the spool. We couldn't use it anymore. But <clears throat> even anytime we have a cable that strikes the the skids on the airframe or whatever, we basically return to base and have it inspected. And I've never seen a cable like destroyed ever. But uh, we've definitely been in in flight with some cable. Uh, issues where we've had to like pull it back in and just close the door with the cable on a, in a pile on the floor or it's up in its housing but not serviceable anymore and we got to return to base and try to switch out for a new helicopter and get one that works mm. so they can fix it change the motor or whatever yeah and let's uh like what are you doing though on a regular basis like you said you kept saying the shop what are you doing in the shop yeah like, so we, uh, it, if you're on uh like a, a standby day so that'd be like what you know like a uh a day that you're on call. So from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., they have, we have two crews, uh, a C-130 crew and then the uh, Griffin crew on the on the, uh, the helicopter. So you go in in the morning, say like 6, 30, 7 o'clock, you check over your gear, you load the helicopter or the Hercules, and then you make sure everything's good for the day. You go for a flight briefing, you go meet up with the crew. If there's uh, any missions at that point, um, they can call you and send you out the door. If not, we'll come up with a training plan for the day of what, who needs what. We got pilots that need training. We got navigators that need training, load masters, flight engineers, depending on what airframe you're working on. Uh, we need uh, jumps and uh, hoists, and everyone you know needs to get their currencies done. So we'll go out and train for uh, depending on what you need and who's there that day and what level guys are working at, right? So then we'll make a plan to go fly somewhere and 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 train. So that's pretty much a day to day. So you do that that Monday to Friday. And that's the crew that's on, uh, we call it standby. So that's a standby crew. And then in the evenings, we have a slash crew, which starts at four o'clock and runs till, you know, basically 6 a.m. the next morning. And they're on, uh, during the day, the standby crew's on 30 minute launch. So you're supposed to be wheels up in 30 minutes or, you know, have to f- justify why you didn't make your launch time. And then in the evenings and weekend was a two hour posture. So we, uh, it's two hours. So we actually stay at home with our phones um, and then they'll call you and say, you know, this is the situation. There's, uh, you know, someone in distress in the water or, uh, the RC, the OPP, the police, uh, Ontario provincial police or the Royal Canadian Mounted police are calling for help. They've got a ATV crash that they can't get to because it's in a, in the wilderness. Um, and we're going to send you guys out to do it, mm-hmm. to go help, to go and assist. So, uh, that's two hours. So you basically have time, you know, you get, grab your stuff, uh, go to the, to, to the air base and then we have our our unit which is what we call the shop you go in and you'll grab your you know go in your locker grab your gear throw your gear on the plane do the checks and then meet up with the aircraft commander get the brief of what's going on maybe call the rescue center the joint rescue center and get some information if you can and then uh get roll and figure out your you know do your map check and see what your distance time is and get dressed for the land or the water wherever you're going and uh start heading out that way now this all sounds consistently operational are you guys not ever doing any 
maintenance or do you guys have any responsibilities on that side of things? Yeah, we've got like, we, we run our own um, training cell that does like all of our administration. So we do that as well. So everyone has a secondary duty. So your primary duty is operations. And then secondary duty would be planning, uh, mountain training, dive training, parachute training, planning that stuff. And then we have guys that are in us in a, in our land maintenance cell. So it'd be like a cargo delivery uh, um, equipment to take care of. So they'll take care of all of our bundles, our parachutes, our survival gear. So uh, any kits that we have that we carry on the plane for, you know, food and water kits, mountain rescue kits. So we've got a mountain cell, a dive cell, a medical cell and uh, a land maintenance. And those guys will take it. There'll be, you know, three or four guys in each one of those and their secondary duties are to order new, make sure we have the carabiners and the ropes and the skis and the ice climbing gear for all operations and for training. The dive guys will same thing, make sure their operational dive gear is packed and checked and ready to roll and make sure they're meeting all the regulations that the Navy puts on for all dive uh, equipment. And then if uh, we do any training, they'll get the stuff ready so we can go to the pool or go to the lake and do some dives. And then uh, the land maintenance guys will take care of the chainsaws and the sawzalls and all that stuff. God uh, make damn sure that's cool. ready. And then we got the medical guys who will make sure the medical gears uh, packed and in service up to date. They'll order uh, all the equipment and drugs from the pharmacy on base and send a guy over to pick it up, make sure it comes uh, and gets into kits. And then we also have training, uh, be in charge of setting up training equipment so that we have gear to train with. And they'll usually come with some training plan and run medical scenarios from time to time. Or if we ask them, hey, we need something, medical scenario uh, this day at this time at this location, can you help us out? And they'll try to find one of their guys and send them out. And then we have two parachute riggers who, who maintain all, all of our parachutes in the shop. Uh, they pack all the reserves and stuff like that and uh, pack all the operational cargo and all the stuff on the plane. They take care of that. And then, so that's pretty much the kind of the makeup of the shop, I guess. It's too much to talk about. Cause I didn't even mention like the whole parachute phase too, that you guys go through because you guys are skydiving out of stuff too. Um, yeah. Really crazy. So what's your job though? What, what's your secondary duty? Um, training, a uh, training coordinator. Oh, cool. But for what, yeah. is it a specific one or all of them? Also? Yeah, we have, I was a ground training. Uh, and then there's an air training that kind of air training takes care of all the air flights that go on. So if one of the crews asks for an extra, extra flights, then they can see if we can man that, if we can put people on that, or they'll make sure that guys are going on the, the standby guys or the right guys going on the right days. And if someone needs to upgrade, so they need to get a, a check uh, to make sure they can go into the next level, then he'll make sure that those guys are linked up with the proper, um, proper aircraft commanders to make sure everyone's in this in the loop for the plan. So now I've just moved into the, the, the next level of it where I'm trying to coordinate, making sure those guys are staying on track and trying to coordinate bigger picture stuff. Like we want to go diving while well, the ground training guy takes care of making sure we get out the door with the vehicles are booked, uh, all that stuff's done. Well, I got to make sure that it's, it's all the contracts are done upstairs and um, that we're going to the right places. So I just come up with a big, bigger picture training plan. But really, it's uh, it definitely just kind of share the load. We kind of wake, make it so that somebody's the air training guy's away on leave or on a exercise for some reason, or if he gets on, he's on a mission for a long duration, or the ground training guy's not there for whatever reason. That someone's always covering off their their job, so it's not getting uh, forgotten, right? Mm. Man, yeah, this is yeah, man. You, kind of, you guys kind have of a great day. Part's boring. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. When you start yeah, talking man. about like going upstairs and yeah, pushing some yeah. paperwork, that's definitely not yeah. the, the fun stuff, but you know, as you get more senior and you, it sounds like you've been in the military for a while now, uh, you, you, it's kind of inevitable. inevitable. To an extent. Yeah. 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 I agree. Uh, yeah. So that's, so yeah, normal day to day is, uh, yeah, show up and train. So we meet up with the AC say, hey, what do you guys want to do today? Uh, hopefully it's scenario based something, some mission that you've seen before in the past, we repeat and try to do it again, try to do it better. Uh, mountain rescues, uh, jumping into areas uh, that we, you know, go to airports around the, around the province and try to jump into the airports and just, uh, you know, practice parachute equipment and landing and dropping gear. So, you know, when you're doing uh, drops to, uh, you know, survivors that need equipment that they're effective drops. So pretty much that's a training day for us to go and fly and uh, make sure we can practice our skills. You'll, yeah. You'll do a couple of those a week uh, and then you'll do a couple nights a week, but tonight I'm going to do my, my night jump. So my the air training guy planned these night jumps, um, you know, at the beginning of the January and he's planned, you know, every week, Tuesday, Thursday night for the next five weeks, we're going to uh, send four guys out and they're going to jump into uh, the frozen lake up in one of our survival areas. And we got some ground support guys on the 
they're there on the ground doing a survival exercise at uh, one of our spots. And then the helicopter will come in um, after we jump in and they'll pick us up and bring us back because we're on two hour call still, even though we're jumping in, we got to be back. Uh, we can't stay at the at survival camp overnight. Uh, sometimes we'll let guys jump in that don't have to work the next day or just on a, a regular office day and they can stay the night and come back the next day on the ground move. So the guys will be out there with their trucks and snowmobiles and they can um, make sure that everything's safe on the drop zone. If someone gets hurt, they got a snowmobile, plus we got a helicopter coming to, uh, to help us out. Yeah, that's the plan. The weather looks good. So we've had a couple of weather issues the last couple of weeks, but it looks like uh, last night they jumped and it was, everything was good. So hopefully tonight goes off. I don't think it's that bad. It's only minus 10, I think right now Celsius. So not a big, we'll be bundled. We got lots of gear too. Like we're, we're fully outfitted in all the, the warm, cozy stuff you need. So Let's talk like uh, let's talk some missions that you've been on. What have you had as far as cases go in Halifax or Ontario? Yeah, I, I uh, we haven't had a ton in Ontario because it uh, seems like the COVID's really slowed everything down, which is great. Guys have been staying inside. Um, yeah, the the last water one I had it was in the summer. We had a no. We went out for a training day. We just thought we'd have it, it was a Friday. We're like, okay, nice easy day. Let's go out to the quarry. We got a, a mountaineering spot just north of us about an hour drive. So we sent the ground team out there with uh, a simulated patient. Someone had fallen off the cliff and it was at the bottom. And we brought, they brought the barbecue, they got the hot dogs, got the burgers, they're all set up. So we fly out there with a the helicopter, we land. We wanna get the pilots out of the helicopter and we want them to see what we do. So they just don't drop us off and fly around and do their own thing and never realize what we're doing on the ground. So they shut down the helicopter. Uh, turn it right off and they jump out and they come and see and we start the mission we start the scenario start doing the rescue go down rappel down get the guy but we'll come up everything's good no problem you know great we start eating our burgers and our our snacks everyone's going to get fueled up for lunch and uh right after we're done eating um you know we kind of look at the wall clock and we're like it's two o'clock on a friday we're done at four we're basically going to get in the helicopter fly home clean up life's good we have lots of gear to clean up we made a huge mess with all the medical equipment all the mountaineering stuff we used all the ropes everything it's going to be a bit of a, a cleanup, perfect timing, two, two o'clock, phone rings, the aircraft commander, she answers the phone. Yep, 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 okay, blah, blah. okay, we're tasked, going for an overdue sailboat in, uh, in, uh, in the Great Lakes. I think it was, I think it was Lake, I don't want to say Lake Erie, but it was down by there. So we fly. It was like a massive flight. We were like, we're at our home base, really, really close to the base. We need to stop and all, like stop my Toronto fuel up. And then we get dressed in our gear for the water. Uh, and then we keep flying even farther south to almost to Detroit. And then we start searching. So we search for a couple bags of gas. We've got two and a half hours endurance. Uh, the C one thirties overhead doing a search pattern. Uh, Coast guards in the in the water in boats searching. We hear the U.S. Coast Guard is start getting spooled up to come join the search, and they'll take a sector of the area. This guy's 77 year old, been overdue for over 10 hours by himself on sailboat. So finally, the Coast Guard says uh, we've, we've we've spotted the boat. So we fly over to that area. See Canadian the boat. or American? It was uh, Canadian. Yeah. yeah. So there's no no U.S. Coast Guard boats at this time, and a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter was coming in to relieve us when our uh, gas was done. Interesting. Now that that's probably, um, St. Clair, is it possible? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. St. Clair is like the one right in between Erie and Huron. Huron. Saint, yeah. So yeah. St. Clair is between Huron. Okay. If Huron flows into St. Clair and then, uh, there's Detroit and then Lake Erie, uh, way down there. So it might've been St. Clair and the Coast Guard, the American Coast Guard station is where I was stationed is air station Detroit technically, but it's not in Detroit. Yeah. It's, it's right off of St. Clair there. Saint Clair. Up, okay, up, cool. up a little bit, so, yeah. so nice. all right, continue. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So anyways, we find, uh, yeah, we find that the coast guard boat finds the, um, the sailboat overturned. So we head over there. Let's go check it out. So we get over, we see it's obviously overturned, which is not a good sign. Obviously, uh, the coast guards, the, the swells are pretty high. Uh, the coast guards got a small rib boat, um, and they're trying to gaff hook the, the sailboat and having, you know, no luck at all. Like this, the swells are just too bad. So, uh, myself and the other guy, we, we end up being two team leaders on the, on the helicopter that day. So, you know, we make the call. Yeah, let's go in. Um, instead of 
uh, we call free entry. So it'd be like a helicopter, like jumping from the helicopter just into the water, you know, like 10, 20 feet up. Yep. Um, instead of doing that, because the waves are so big, we don't want the risk of the helicopter getting hit by a wave if we get really close down to the water. So we op- just hoist us in. We'll just hoist in, safe. Uh, they'll hoist us down, make a plan. He's going to wait for me. We'll swim to the boat, check it out. So we swim over to the boat, sees like just rocking. Um, we look and we try to, you know, duck dive underneath, just breath hold. We don't have any scuba gear with us. We don't carry any uh, scuba gear. Uh, we just jump, you know, jump on a leaf, try to clear the lines, try to look inside. There's really no um, spot in the sailboat that anyone could get stuck, right? So we realize this guy's not tied in the lines. He's not trapped. He's not there at all. So um, we go, I go over, talk to the Coast Guard, get the, a, a tow line from them. Um, and we grab the tow line, I attach it to the boat, and we start to, uh, we go climb in the boat, and we start to radio up the helicopter, let them know what's going on, and start to tow the boat uh, into shallower water so we could try to turn it over, try to write it and try to, figure, and try to see just to confirm, like we, we're pretty sure he's not here. We are down in those his nets, but it is a uh, rock and sea. So we want a uh, confirmation uh, that way too. Everyone can, if he's not, if he's there and we got him, maybe he's not in a good way, but at least everyone else can, you know, we can stand down all the assets and they can uh, head back to their bases. So like we start pulling on the line and we are going nowhere. This little boat can cannot pull the sailboat for anything. It's got like they put the GPS coordinates and it's going to be like a six hour trip to get back to the harbor. So they send out another a bigger boat. The bigger boat comes. We transfer the the uh, the boat the sailboat off to them. And they start towing it over. The, the uh, Coast Guard boat, like the rib, rips us to the harbor. The helicopter lands at the harbor, transfers us over. We jump back in the helicopter go back to the gas station, fill up a bag of gas. And plan is now like nine o'clock at night. We've been going all day, I think three, three full tanks of gas. And we're running low on our crew day, which is our allowable time to fly because the pilots obviously can't be flying all day. It's, it's not safe. So we're running low on our crew day and our helicopter is running out of maintenance hours. I'm sure you're aware, tail inspections, rotor inspections, all this stuff. So we're running up to our 25 hour and we gotta, we gotta get it back home to get inspected or we're staying the night there hoteling it and we need to get a, a team to come down in vehicles the next day to do the inspection we'll have to get our tech our technicians our flight mechanic or our so that's pretty much the option it's middle of cold like it's still high COVID season we're trying not to stay anywhere off base uh we're trying to stay close to home so we get a waiver middle of the night basically 10 o'clock at night get a, a coffee in you and we're gonna we're gonna push the the hours and we're gonna get back to to the air base um we gotta fly Middle of the night, right over Lake Ontario. So everyone's tired. It's been a long day. Uh, super bummed out. Obviously found the boat. The guy's not there. So the search is continuing, but our, our day's done and we're heading home. And on the way home, you know, at like 4,000 feet over the pitch black uh, Lake Ontario, what happens? We strike a bird, of course, hit a bird. So aircraft commander uh, starts checking out the systems, making sure everything's okay. Starts going through the process. And it seems like all our flight instruments and everything's okay. And we, uh, we start heading towards shore, but we know if we go towards shore, we're not gonna have enough gas to make it home. We're gonna have to stop. Once we stop, we're done. So they make, we make the decision, they make the decision. I mean, they're the, the pros up there up front. So they make the decision to keep pushing through and they push it to um, back home and we make it home safely and uh, no incidents. So that was, that was my last uh, um, actual mission where we got launched on something and we're out doing it. So. I was expecting like a terrible punchline of like, and then we oh, made the decision to, to keep going and, and it didn't work. We out. went down. <laughs> <laughs> we went down. No. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Long night, long, long day. And then, yeah. So that search continued for another couple of days and yeah, it was just not, not a good outcome, I guess for that guy, 77 year old, uh, male with no life jacket. Mm. So hard to find those people, right? Sounds like he had a good life though. Sailing yeah, 77. So yeah, we just finished that flight back and whew, man, not ideal. Hitting a bird in the middle of the night with a helicopter that doesn't have any floats or water capability. Um, not really ideal. So we ended up limping it back, uh, making, you know, we had a nice little dent on the on the plane, but everything was kosher. So no, no issue, but yeah. That's cool. That's a good insight as to like a, a typical search and rescue case uh, for for people that basically do what do so um, yeah that is, yeah that's good insight now like how many people are actually working as far as like star techs go at your station so like how many we have station is uh 27 i think it is the number we have right now oh that's a lot okay yeah. and how many uh throughout you'd say canada 
Uh, 150 approximately. Not, and not all operational. Some of them are staff positions for in those 100. And I think our line number is 139. So some of them, like we've got a you know a couple of chiefs and stuff like that that don't fly anymore. Uh, a couple of warrant officer positions that don't, they're staff jobs and they go for a staff job for two, three years and then they can come back um, and come back and fly as different positions. So in our shop, we have basically uh, a master corporal is our is our working rank. So that's everybody shows up when you graduate on course, you get promoted if you were, if if you weren't already. And then as you go through about four or five years, depending on the, what what you, uh, year you're in, you'll get promoted to sergeant. So you can be a team leader. So first you're a team member, then you become a team leader. You can be a team leader as a master corporal. It doesn't you don't have to be a sergeant to be a team leader. Um, typically, if you're a sergeant, you're you're a team leader. Uh, and then the warrant officer is, uh, we have one of those in the shop and he's in charge of like uh, yeah, procedures, and protocol stuff, discipline. Uh, he liaises with other units around the country and he goes on to, you know, making sure our mountain, our mountain procedures, when they want to review it, he meets with all those guys and they do a big review. When the medical needs to be reviewed, they meet up and do the review. So he's kind of like that, that tentacle that reaches out to all the other shops and has that, uh, connection, but he's still operational. So the warrant officer is still flying, still um, uh, qualified on both airframes. And he actually holds our, our, our check, uh, chief check, which means he's in charge of all the standards. Um, so he can't, no one can, can do uh, a check ride and upgrade people without his, uh, his blessing or his knowledge. And he kind of has that, uh, that holds that criteria. And then you have above him is the uh, master warrant officer, the MWO. And he's the senior SARTEC leader, so the STL. And he'll, uh, yeah, he's in charge, same thing. He's in charge of all the guys and making sure that he talks to the command upstairs. So the commanding officer, um, the deputy commanding officer and the flights uh, kind of, he's that key person. He's our highest rank and he runs uh, that stuff. And then he talks with the chief and all the other shops around the country um, for, you know, more manning and stuff, coordinating uh, when people are getting moved from station to station, how many people can ebb and flow and uh if there's something that needs you know clarification some a waiver go on because you've missed some type of qualification he's kind of the guy that clears that up to make sure yeah this is what we're gonna this is a, he's a final call on everything hey guys i want to go mountain climbing in uh, colorado and he says no you're not doing that you're going mountain climbing in uh, alberta okay or yeah sounds good so oh sign it. shucks he's got, yeah he's got <laughs> the budget he's got the, the authority to sign off on that stuff and and he's our yeah he's our our top guy for us at the at the shop. And he, every every shop has one of those. Um, smaller shops don't. He's not the same rank. He's one rank lower, but same position. S uh, STL we call him senior uh, team lead. How much money does he make? I don't know, hundred grand, hundred plus. That's pretty good. Canadian. Yeah. Canadian. Um, yeah. So like what sixty American, seventy American. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd I'd say if you're saying let's say if it's one twenty. That'd probably be 90? 90? 90 grand, to know. yeah, 80, 85. Let's see. I'm looking this up right now for folks. People want to know. 120 yeah. CAD to USD, like 94. Yeah. Thousand. So if he's making 120, it'd be 94. Oh, he's making more like 100, I think. I, I'm not sure, but I'm only making about 90. Oh, you're making 90? Uh, well, that's great. That's, yeah. that's probably better than the average well it depends like as you rank up it's similar i'd say it's similar to yeah. a, a rescue swimmer in the coast guard so 78 yeah. if if that guy's making 100 and you you say you're making around what 70 about around 90 oh 90 sorry canadian yeah yeah which is about 70 that's just yeah. really good pay that's that's yeah. good for for a, a guy that gets to play around jump out of helicopters and do cool things and probably have a, a great community there um yeah Sounds like a, That'd be a, a great bunch cool of guys. Game. Yeah, and that that uh, information is all public access. It's government uh, Canada. You just have to know what you're looking at because we do have specialty pays columns. So if you know what a Sartex getting uh, spec two, which is our highest level spec pay, plus we get rescue pay on top of it. So the rescue pay is not pensionable, but your spec pay is pensionable. So it's a nice little uh, bonus when you retire. You get your best years of pension. Oh yeah, how does the retirement go? So you 25, for me, it's 25 years. It used to be 20 years, but I, I missed that uh, document. So 25 years, and then you'll get your five best years. Um, the 60% of your five best years, I believe. That's pretty cool. Yep. That's yeah, similar, that's to the, no. similar to the Coast Guard, except I think it's the best two or something. So that's cool. So if you finish up at those higher ranks, those you know, MWOs and chief warrant officers and stuff like that, then yeah, pension's a little bit better. It jacks up uh, as you go higher, but... 
at the end of the day, I think it's a good job and good pay anyway. So I'm happy. I'm happy where I'm at. For sure. Um, yeah. What's a lower, cause you know, you're a Sergeant. So what, all right, for example, say I joined the Sartex, you know, within like yeah. four years, what would I be looking at? You I, th- think? I think it's like 80, 80 something mid eighties. Oh. Yeah. So pretty God decent. Damn. Cause like as soon as you graduate, so you'll go through course the one year when you go through course, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be crappy. It'll be like, I think it's like 65, something like that. Cause you'll get corporal level pay when you graduate on graduation you get, um, yeah, you get upgraded to master corporal. So then you'll get master corporal spec pay. So of course you don't get spec pay and you'll get rescue pay and you're, you get downgraded. If you're not, if you're a higher rank, when you transfer, then you get downgraded to rank. If you're uh, a lower rank, I think you stay at that low rank for the, for the course. We had all corporals or higher. So everyone was a corporal. All this everywhere. I was a sergeant before in the army. I got downgraded a lot, took a pay cut, did the course after the, after the course got the pay incentive uh, mm. back basically. And, made a little more than I was in the army. So if I were to join though, I would have to go do the same process you think, or since I have kind of a medical background, still an EMT in America, I'm basically asking you as a recruiter now, (laughs) but like if I, if I were, I wonder like, would I, you think I'd still have to become like go in in a certain sector of the military for a couple of years. And exactly because I don't, I, from what I know, the direct entry program is not up and running anymore. So you'd have to Mm -hmm come in and join them, join the military in a certain, whatever trade you wanted. Uh, it could be anything from cook to clerk to infantry, and then you do your minimum service there. And then you can apply after that. So I, I think I read a document the other day for combat arms, it could be three years, but for any other trade, it's four years, I believe, but mm. pretty much all the guys that I ran through course with were either combat arms or in support of a combat arms unit. So like a, a radio operator that worked at a combat arms unit, or a firefighter or like a pilot or something like that. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Most of our guys are, we have a lot of army, army background. Um, there's a majority of our people. We still have Navy guys and air force guys that are awesome. Uh, but yeah, it just seems like we have a lot of infantry guys, a lot of combat engineers. Is it labeled as a branch in the, in Canada as well? So we have the army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the air force and the coast guard. Those are like the five U S branches. Is yeah. that kind of how it's viewed in Canada? Yeah. So we have three branches. So army, uh, army, Navy and air force. So this is all air force, all uh, Royal Canadian air force. Yeah. That we fall under. Yeah. That's cool. So, and, and then the coast guard is not part of the military. They're part of the gov- like they're part of the government, but the military doesn't, uh, doesn't have we don't can't transfer the coast. I don't even know what the process would be. I have to apply for the Coast Guard. I couldn't just go and if I want to transfer within the military to a different branch. I can go to on base to my uh personal selection officer and go and start apply my application there. If I wanted to apply for the Coast Guard, I have to like physically apply for another agency and have to transfer. Like my pension would transfer, my everything would transfer. Where if I just stayed in the army or went to the army, uh, went to the navy, I just bounce around within here and very little paperwork on my part just apply do the selection or do the application and move over i uh, i visited the canadian coast guard academy i think and it's it's a pretty grueling selection process just to get into that nice. but it's cool you get to have a beard if you're in the canadian coast guard which you have a yeah. beard too which is yeah cool. so we're uh we're all authorized for beers now in the canadian armed forces um, we, we're restricted for us, uh, because of COVID. Um, so we got to be fit tested in 95s because I had a beard prior and I'd be able to keep a trim a beard when I'm on shift. So if I was, if there's a patient contact, a risk of a patient contact, you have to have a basically clean shaved face. So you can wear your N95 mask and not get any, uh, uh, particulates in there. But if we go on a, like on a mountain exercise or a dive exercise, you can uh, start growing your beard, no problem. Hey, it's my partner Cody Wright that just called in on a speakerphone. Cody, we're we're recording the podcast with the Sartek. You got any cool questions for him? You're on the podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> what is this like an episode of? It sounds like the Bill Burr podcast. Are you actually live? Yeah, we're live, dude. You're you're on the podcast <laughs> actively. No, I'm on the spot here. I don't actually have any good questions. God, Cody, Cody, the secondary host on episode 64 is just coming in short shit. Dude, they, this is so cool, though. We've been talking about just all the craziness that they go through as far as like Arctic training. Their like selection phase is survival phase, like pretty much where they're in oh. like the winter. And like he's talking to me about uh, snowshoeing and log lifts. 
it's just gnarly it's just a whole different thing and like doing nooses to catch a rabbits like <laughs> it's what? yeah it's insane it's really cool it's very diversified too yeah yeah it's That's gonna be awesome. a good episode to listen i'm excited yeah yeah we're, we're going on two hour plus so you got you got anything for this guy nope i got nothing i was right. going to talk rsm but we'll, we'll talk later all right bye bye all right see ya yeah anyway <laughs> yeah that could have been fun so um <laughs> yeah hey um uh, let's just end on uh maybe a, another uh, a memorable case whether that's yours or another sartex what do you what do you got what's something crazy yeah i'll just do my own i think because that way i can speak more uh accurate on it but it was actually my first uh first mission that i had ever done and i was out at 413 in greenwood uh on the the Comoran helicopter. So I was flying as a third person. So when you go through your training package, um, you're before until you're qualified, you're a restricted team member. Until you get that team member category, you're stuck as a as a restricted team member. So that means I have to fly with two qualified people. So I had two other qualified guys on me or with me. We go, uh, we get a call for a cruise ship out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and it's got a elderly gentleman with who's uh, had a stroke. Either got a doctor on board, they got a nurse on board. So you know, pretty stable guy, but they need to get him off the ship. The ship's going to be like three days to get back to, to port. And they're going into Halifax and we're going to be out there in less than three hours. So we get dressed because we're, it's middle of summer. It's like 32 degrees outside or something like that. It's steaming hot um, Celsius. And so we, we jump in, it's like 90, it's like, it's like 90 degrees Fahrenheit or something. We jump in uh, the helicopter. We start heading out towards the, uh, the ocean. As soon as we get all close to the ocean, we got to get dressed into our dry suits because um, we're doing over water operations. Uh, so, so we start getting dressed. We stand up in a helicopter. This one's nice and large helicopter. You can stand up and get dressed. We get dressed in our full diving dry suits. Um, and the glass windows on the helicopter are just beaming in the heat. Uh, we got like the air conditioning blowing. I get my sleeves open, trying to like get some cold air in there. Just dying, drinking as many waters as you can. So we get out there. The guys come up with a plan. Okay, we're going to hoist in. There'll be three of us going in. We'll go to the deck of the cruise ship. Uh, John will go first. Greg will go second. And you'll guide uh, Brad down with um, Brad down. John's going to take the medical gear. He's going to go right to the patient, start his assessment. Yeah, you stay there, bring out, bring down uh, Brad in the rescue basket. And then once you and him are on the, on the deck, you guys will come over and uh, I'll take over. Greg, Greg, you'll take over the medical and John will do the, the mission brief, the mission stuff talk to the doctor, get the hand over everything. We'll do a full set of vitals on the patient, get everything sorted out. Yep, sounds good, sounds good. So get everything on the deck and I'm coiling up my gear and getting everything ready. And I am just like dripping sweat, just pouring out of me. So this next thing is like sealed right up to my neck with my dry suit and water is just pouring off my face, super sweaty, dying. First one, my, like I'm, I'm pumped up, right? I'm super pumped. We're on the cruise ship, we came in, everyone was there. We got the C-130 as top cover flying overhead. Um, in case something happens and we need rescue from them. So there, there are our eyes above and I'm just dripping sweat all over the place. And the lady, some, some cruise ship lady, nicest lady ever asked me, oh, sir, do you need a towel or something? Do you need, do you need something? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm just, I'm literally go, I walk on the carpet and sweat is pooling off of my face, dripping. I go, I show up to the, to the scene where the doctor, the nurses, everyone's staring at me like, what is, what is going on with this guy? My face is probably red covering sweat. I had this big beard at the time and uh made me probably made me sweatier i started doing getting a set of vitals on this guy and i'm just dying and uh yeah we get we finally get everything loaded up and we get out of there uh, but yeah it was just uh i felt it was so hot i think i ended up dumping like a liter once we took our suits off it all gets stuck in the feet and i dumped a liter of, of like sweat out of my suit just a garbage bag full of uh full of sweat we took the guy back to halifax and uh dropped him off in uh, a soccer field to an ambulance and uh, yeah, that was my first time, first mission, first patient contact, first real like, you know, situation where I had to like hoist in, hoist out and do all that stuff. And all I remember is like profusely sweating and trying to pack my gear, looking up and this lady's like, do you need a, a towel or something? I was, just, I was so disappointed that I looked like I was, in, I was in distress. I felt like, man, what I must look like right out of her. These people are think I need help, right? So anyways, that was probably, really fun because i got my buddy brad took a really sweet uh sweet video of it i'll send it to you it's on youtube oh cool you made a wicked video uh of it so that's pretty cool uh but yeah it was uh it was a hot day and it it was horrible because the i mean the ocean's like 10 degrees so you got to be in your in your suit and uh yeah 
Yeah, I'll add that video for the end here for folks that are that tuned in this long. Awesome. Um, that reminds me, those dry suits, yeah, it's, it's basically putting a plastic bag all around you. It's not made out of plastic, but it just yeah. encapsulates everything. And there was a new rescue swimmer that showed up to the shop. And I recall, I don't know, like it was just that good old fashioned hazing, but he he's in the locker room. And at one point I'm chatting and I just incorporate in a conversation with a friend of mine. I go, I think it was Cody actually. I go like, oh man, I had such a great relief pee today. And he goes, wait, weren't you wearing a dry suit? Isn't it dry suit temps right now? And I go, yeah, dude, what, you haven't taken a dry suit pee? And he goes, what do you mean? Like you pee in your dry suit? I was like, yeah, you haven't peed in your dry suit yet? And he goes, no, I figured you wouldn't do that. Like I've peed in my wetsuit. And he, we were like, both me and I think Cody look at each other. We go, this guy, this guy hasn't even warmed up his dry suit. Dude, it, yeah. it encapsulates all the heat and just keeps you nice and toasty. I can't believe you haven't done that yet. And he, he goes, you guys are fucking with me. You guys are fucking with me. We're like, all right, whatever. <laughs> so then I think Cody like played along the next time he goes, oh man, I had such a good relief warming <laughs> pee. It was so cold out in the lake. Cause we, again, we're in the Great Lakes too. And he goes, that was, that was just, oh, I'm nice and toasty now. Um, and he gets back and the same guy's there and he goes, doesn't that smell? And we're like, nah, you just rinse it out. It's totally fine. It's good to go. And we just, he knew we were messing with him for a while, but then we kept doing it in such a kind of a smart way of approaching it <laughs> that one day he comes in to the locker room and he goes, you know, I mean, hats off to you guys. I agree. It kind of sucks. It's all in one leg, uh-huh. but it does keep you warm. And we go. No way. No way. <laughs> and we just knew we played the long game on that one. <laughs> just uh yeah, kept his dry suit warm with a little pee at that time and it was a, it was a good talking point for for a couple years to come. That's awesome. That's classic. Is you got his desk pop in. Yeah. <laughs> good old yeah, classic. Desk What's pop. dry suit dry suit pee, mm-hmm. little desk yeah. pop, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um that's cool. What what uh I feel like the British Columbia Sartex must get like some of the most epic stuff. And that one that you were saying up in Gander. Great White. Yeah. Yeah. Gander is the busiest uh, spot and they get the, the gnarliest stuff for sure. Where's Gander again? They're like, they're like our uh, Newfoundland. So they're like our yeah. kind of like our Kodiak Alaska style station, right? Yeah. Like the boats covered in ice and uh, you know, fishermen in just out there, you know, working for a living, trying to fish and they'll, they'll go in any weather because that's their job. That's their livelihood, right? So, yeah. You know. And what kind of, they just get yeah. those big sea rescues. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Lots of patients, lots of uh, heart attacks, people cutting themselves uh, on boats with, you know, fishing equipment and stuff like that. We had some of those out in the East coast when I was there, guys getting cut in their hands, uh, fishing on, you know, cutting, cleaning fish, getting trapped in uh, breaking nets and getting pulled overboard. Lots of man overboard stuff. Some boats take it, take it on water. Like that's that. that's scary my cousins are lobster fishermen in cape britain yeah uh yeah near port hood which is yeah just northern nova scotia there and yeah he got caught in a, a rig i think setting a trap or something and it was pulling him under and then i think they had to, i don't know how it works i never was have really been out there when they're fishing but i think they had to yeah stop the winch and then yeah. hold hold them from going down because everything's dragging them down very yeah. scary type stuff and yeah. then they have their, their waders too so that's sucking them underwater yeah it's pretty gnarly as the fisherman lifestyle goes yeah um yeah, right on um cool. hey thanks so much I, I know you got your flight and you got to prep for that you got to jump out of planes tonight and i would yeah. truly love to have you on that other podcast and we can talk some more survival and I'm sure there's Sartex that have gotten into predicaments with wildlife too, huh? Yeah, yeah for sure, man. Yeah, so we could do that yeah. down the road. Yeah, if you want me to find a like a survival expert or one of our trapper guys or two, I can help you with that also. Maybe oh, that could be awesome. Yeah. It, like the guys that train you guys or another Sartex that's just specialized in that? Well, yeah, he was one of the guys who was training guys at the school before. He was uh, at the schoolhouse or whatever at the unit, at the squad. Um, the school and then now he's here one of our guys that are just senior guys and he's a uh a trapper and it's like his thing he goes out on the weekends and spends his time trapping beavers and muskrats and tracking all that stuff he's super good at it and you got a guy that makes gloves uh traps fo- uh foxes coyotes and stuff and makes hats and gloves and sells them on uh, etsy or whatever you know what's That's the thing all right i 100 am inclined to to do that yeah absolutely yeah. i would love to do that 
Do you think he, this trapper, though, can figure out Zoom? Can we get him on Zoom? Yeah, we'll help him out, man. Oh, sweet. Yeah, he's, yeah. Good, he's good to go. Oh, hell yeah. Well, that'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, cool. so that was Sergeant Gregory Hudson. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks awesome, for what man. you do. Thanks yeah. a lot for having me. All right, thank you, everyone. That was Sergeant Gregory Hudson. If you want to support the rest of the mindset, you know what to do. Go and rate and review on the Apple Podcast. Wildertainment as well. Follow that and rate and review that. It won't be hosted on the rest of the mindset anymore. And what else can you do? Of course, you can go on the rescuesormindset.com and start training and getting fit like a helicopter rescue swimmer with one of our programs, the Hold Your Breath Like a Helicopter Rescue Swimmer program, the Win the Day program, the Perfect Form, and a bunch of others running programs. So if you're trying to get an elite military fitness shape, then please support us by getting into shape and getting one of our programs. That is all. Toodle blue.